To the beat of this drum, Boise State and Idaho have danced 27 times on the gridiron, but this ball may be the biggest of them all. In front of the largest crowd ever to see a sporting event in the state of Idaho, the Broncos will play for their best ever Division 1A finish, while the opponent, the University of Idaho, fights for a trip to the humanitarian bowl game. The troops are here, and it's time for Idaho's 28th Super Bowl. The battle begins next on Channel 6. Thousand plus fans dressed in blue and orange and black and gold filling Bronco Stadium to the rim in anticipation of rivalry Saturday in here in Boise they call it simply the Super Bowl today Boise State with a record of six and four hosts arch rival Idaho with a mark of seven and three and how do everyone and welcome from wherever you're watching across the great state of Idaho and beyond my name is Dave Tester set to bring you all the play-by-play -play action of this game that all you have to say is Boise State in Idaho, and everyone knows what you're talking about. Joining me, as always, my colleague Joe Hughes, whose assignment yesterday was to meet the University of Idaho at the airport, but that didn't come through. What happened, Joe? Well, they were supposed to come into Boise around 4.30, and I would have been waiting a very long time because, as it turns out, the, the Vandals had problems with their charter flight, ended up having to take buses through Pendleton, Oregon, didn't arrive here in Boise until 2.30 this morning. There is one guy, though, that will give the Vandals a wake-up call. It is running back Aaron Hurley of the Broncos, the senior playing his best ball ever. You see nine touchdowns on the season, and you remember the last touchdown he scored against the Vandals? It was the game winner in overtime. Says it was the biggest touchdown of his life. Ironically enough, though, the Vandals will tell you that this guy, receiver Rodney Smith, beat him last year. Rodney Smith coming off of a great week against New Mexico State. Four touchdowns, 200 yards receiving. He's really elevated his play. Well, those are the guys the Broncos are hoping will have a big game when we come back. The St. Al's injury report and a couple of the key Idaho Vandals. The Super Bowl is just around the corner. winner is coming to Idaho but he'll have to wait for one more football game Broncos and Vandals let's take a look at today's injury report which is brought to you by St. Al's Life Flight call 1-800-574-9464 to join because it's your life Cornerback Dempsey D's number 41 has had two weeks to nurse that sore ankle, but it still bothers him a little bit. And senior number 84, Tony Mamrell, that hamstring still bothers him. He will dress down, but probably won't play too much. When you talk Idaho Vandal football, there is one guy you have to look right to, and it would be Joel Thomas. Number one is the heart and soul of the Vandal football team. Yeah, and he's also one. Of, he's leading the Big West in touchdowns with 14 touchdowns. You see his yards. Uh, that's a 14th in the nation. You need to stop Joel Thomas if you're going to stop the Vandals. Bronco football coach Dirk Cutter says, though, Ryan Skinner is the best player on this team. Take a look at the number of tackles. 96 tackles for Skinner. Uh, the, di the direction of the defense always goes his way. He likes to stop everybody. Well, we've talked about it on paper. It's time to go down on the blue for Bronco football taking on the Vandals. Coach K in his first ever as a head man ready to rock and roll. have the edge winning 16 times losing 10 times one draw on this day in Idaho everyone stops for a moment to watch the Broncos and Vandals Idaho receiving the kick that's Chris Lacey look out for the speedster as he pushes it all the way up to the 42 and we are set to play football as the Broncos winning the toss defer it and the Vandals will have the football. The man leading the way for the University of Idaho, John Welsh, just a freshman, says he's waited a year and a half for this game. He stood on the sidelines in the Kibbe Dome a year ago thinking, what if? And the freshman uh, has played awfully well in his last two games. This is Welsh's fourth start. Started against LSU early in the season. That is first ever start. Idaho State, New Mexico State, and here against the Broncos. Hands it off to Joel Thomas, and Thomas has nowhere to run as that Bronco defensive front 
puts on a hold. Let's take a look now at our starting lineup, sponsored as always by Commercial Tire, driven to be the best. Vandal O-line column, a group of misfits that have come together to form a solid front. Patrick Venzi, all the way from Germany, goes six, seven, 300 pounds. Could see up to five receivers at one time for the Vandals, but the man is running back Joel Thomas, Idaho's all-time leading rusher with 3,800 yards in his career. Second down and nine as Thomas picks up a yard. They throw it to Joel Thomas. Thomas catches it out of the backfield, has a lot of room to run, and finally is brought down at the 22 by Damian Schilling. Boy, just uh, impressive to the fact that they didn't go to Joel Thomas on that play. It's Jerome Thomas coming up with the big play. The defensive line looks like this. Uh, they are considered the strength of the team for the Broncos. Malloy, Rodman, Setzer, and Bennett. Brian Johnson is the leading tackler with 69 for the Broncos. Secondary led by Dempsey D. Tops in the Big West with four interceptions. So already, Joe, the Vandals knock it on the door. Two plays, and they've marched it down to the 22 of Boise State. Whistle on the play. And I think they used too much time. It also looked like uh, Welsh had a little bit of trouble getting the snap, and it was probably because he saw it was the clock was winding down and was trying to pull out before he actually had the ball. Prior to the snap, full start on the offense. Five-yard penalty remains first down. Jack Wood, who's the referee, seems like we've seen him all season long. He's over his cold that he had back in Reno. <laughs> right, yeah. His voice sounds much better than it did over in uh, Nevada. Very tester Joe Hughes and the entire six on your side crew hoping you're enjoying this one, BSU and Idaho. Welsh on the keeper, and that is a design play, and they like Welsh's mobility. They do, and uh, but this time it was the Bronco defense that was uh, ready for the. The Broncos have already been burned a, a couple of times. See, there was a Sean Sandoval getting in. Uh, he's reading it. You see him in the center of your screen now, and nobody blocks him. He just gets right around to the offensive line and uh, knocks Welsh down uh, for the tackle. Welsh, uh, but you do say, Dave, he is very mobile, but Sean S Sandoval sniffed that to play out from the get-go. Sandoval, just a sophomore from Tucson. He and Ty Dayton share that linebacking duty. So after a loss of two, it brings up second down and 12. 13-minute mark of this ball game just underway. Pass goes off to Willie Alderson. Alderson trying to get past Sandoval and does not. And what about Willie Alderson, who grew up almost in the shadows of Bronco Stadium? Oh, sure. Oh, right over at Nampa High School. He's, uh, he actually came up to Idaho as a running back, but uh, he is now converted to a wide receiver spot, and he just has tremendous speed. They're just trying to get the ball out to him on the flat, and hopefully he breaks tackle uh, for the Vandals and, and gets uh, downfield with that speed. Broncos again, though. Defense starting to, to toughen up uh, down here inside their own 25. Already a big play for the Bronco D. Just underway. They're faced with a third and nine after the Vandals on a little Joel Thomas swing pass. Move it down to the 22. Travis Stombaugh in motion. Pass is tossed. Almost picked off. Jeff Davis was shocked to see the football coming into his arm. And he's shaking his head number four, but he breaks it up and forces the Vandals to boot it. Right, and uh, if you take a notice, there, there's Jeff. Uh, he's a senior playing in his last game at Bronx State. Take a look at his right hand, though. He's got that broken thumb. And I don't know if it has. A, it actually affects this, but no, actually, it's his good hand that he actually got a hold of it. It, it looked like he didn't even try to use the right hand, but uh, defensive stop for the Broncos. So the Vandals will be forced to try a third. 38-yard field goal. This is Ben Davis, who transferred from Rick's College, grew up in Coeur d'Alene. Kick is on the way, and the Vandals are first on the board after number 33 puts three on. Vandals up 3-0, and there's a number of Vandal fans in this stadium. Oh, absolutely, and they, they like nothing better than to, to get their own team on the board. Uh, I've been trying to estimate just about how many Vandal fans we actually see here at Bronco Stadium. I don't know whether it's a, a third of the crowd or what. That's probably a, a, a fairly decent guess, but yeah, they've uh, a lot of Vandal fans in the Treasure Valley come out for this game every two years. The largest crowd ever to see a game, and if you put that into perspective into the state of Idaho as far as the biggest city, you know what? <laughs> this stadium is the fifth biggest city in the state of Idaho. Right now, yeah, right up there with Twin Falls, Coeur d'Alene, Lewiston. How about that? So a fabulous statistic to see that uh, the state is indeed growing. And when you have a stadium like this, 
and of course the expansion. Dr. Rook, who is the president here at Boise State, telling me he's already had requests to close in the other half of the stadium. <laughs> right, and I tell you what, I'm looking around and I'm not seeing very many empty seats here, and there are some people I'm sure who are a little bit late arrivals. Coach Tormey knew it was going to be 30,000 plus. He wants, to, he's happy to see his Vandals on top early. Chris Tormey, who not only has coached in this game, but he has played. He was a defensive end back 1973 through 77, so he knows what it is all about. As the Vandals get ready to kick it off, that is Ben Davis, who just kicked the field goal. By the way, the Vandals marching uh, 36 yards in six plays and scoring to go up 3-0. So Davis kicks it off, and it'll be Shenard Hartz taking it at the 15. Hartz bobbing and weaving up to the 26 and a nice return. Question mark, who starts at quarterback? Well, we can tell you that for the last 10 days, Nate Sparks has had an injured thumb, probably will not play in this football game. Thus, Bart Hendricks will come on, and who will ever forget the game number 17 had a year ago in the Kibbe Dome? Oh, absolutely. More than 370 yards passing. He had the most yards passing for a Bronco quarterback ever against a Vandal team. You see his numbers for this season. So Hendricks brings the troops up. He's got three receivers to the top of the screen, one to the bottom, so there are four in the package. Single setback is Aaron Hurley as Antoine Wilson takes it off on a little end around, and Wilson lowers his head, picking up about six yards. The Bronco offensive line averaging nearly 300 pounds. Senior Jermaine Bellin, starting in his 40th game, leads the way up front. Running back Aaron Hurley needs 120 yards to go over 1,000. Two weeks ago, receiver Rodney Smith caught four touchdowns in a win against New Mexico State University. For Antoine Wilson, that's his 12th carry on the ground. And he's got just over 70 yards. He picks up three there to bring up a second down and seven. We saw a lot of that earlier in the season, but not as much lately. Hendricks throws it. Wilson, two for two. He's run one, and now he caught one there. Not quite enough for the first down as you look at the Vandal front. Mal Tosi plays football and basketball. Will Beck, he is a freshman that goes 300 plus pound. The backers, everything funnels in the flex defense to Ryan Skinner, 96 tackles on the season. The secondary led by Gibbs and Gardner, six interceptions between the duo. So it is third down and one for the Broncos. 35% on the season on third down conversions. They hand it off to Hurley, stutters for a moment and then lowers his head and gets the first down. And right up the middle, too. It went right over the top of Ryan Skinner, who we just talked about with his 96 tackles coming in uh, to this game. Hurley will do that the entire game. He loves running straight forward. And talking about Skinner, just to give you an idea of just how many tackles he has, the best uh, uh, tackler on the, the Broncos only has 69 tackles. He had 96, 97 now. Of course, the coaching staff will tell you that is because of the style of defense that the Vandals run, similar to the Arizona Desert Swarm, which Coach Cutter said, I saw plenty of that at Oregon. Hendricks passes it up, trying to get it to Rodney, overthrows him. And on the incomplete pass, it'll bring up second down. That time the Broncos running a little stutter step by the way of Rodney. A little hesitation by Rodney, and then he just bolts upfield, hoping uh, that Barch is going to be able to throw it over the top of the defense. Actually fairly well read by the uh, Vandal secondary, because uh, by the time uh, the ball was in the vicinity of Smith, he was double covered. Hendricks, who was a sophomore last year uh, defeating the Vandals, Ryan Skinner said, you know what, I tried to intimidate the freshman, but he played great. You know, number 44 will be talking to the quarterback who's going to go down. So Matt Jasek picking up his eighth sack, the junior from El Segundo, California, stopping Hendricks. Boy, just heavy pressure that time. And you see picking up another sack, which was second on the team. And you see the pressure will come first from the outsides. And uh, Bart feels it, so he steps ahead. And who's right there to meet him? But big number 35, Matt Jasek, uh, the 215-pound senior. And uh, he also has 10 tackles for loss this season. So look for him. He likes getting in that backfield. Third down and 15, a score in from Dallas, North Texas, leading New Mexico State 13 to three. We'll talk about what that means as far as bowl implications later on. Hendricks has to get it to the 50 and does as Jeff puts here. The freshman from Eagle goes up and brings it down. That's right. Well, we've talked all season long about how one of the best hands on the team is someone like Rodney Smith. Well, look at Jeb Putzier. He is, uh, in terms of uh, Dirk Cutter's 
evaluation. He has the best hands of anybody on the Bronco team, and you can see why right here. Right across the middle, and look at him just bring that in. And even after the hit, still hanging on to it. Nice play by Putz here. So he gets the first down. Coach Cutter says next to Antoine Wilson, Jeb Putz here is the most improved player on this team. His Eagle Bunch right now is old team playing for the state title in Pocatello. So the Broncos move into Vandal territory for the first time. Hendricks will run option, keeps it, and tries to get it up to the 40. What about this philosophy, Coach Cutter, saying we can't run it up the middle, we've got to run option? Well, that flex defense you've been talking about already, Dave, just sort of funnels everything right to the way of Skinner. So one way to combat that is not go up the middle. Try to push everything to the outsides around the end. See, Bart has, has rushed several times the, this season, and that's mainly been on that option play. Uh, either side of the football field, look for the Broncos to run a lot towards the wide side of the field, try to spread out that flex defense. Eight minutes, 45 Five seconds to go in the first frame. We're just underway. Boise State in all blue taking on the Idaho Vandals. There's a fumble. I believe one of the men in blue picking it up. It looked like uh, Jermaine Bellin. Big Jermaine Bellin covering the ball. Number 67, whose brother played here. He walked on, and who would have ever thought he would start in 40 straight games? Well, that's a good heads-up play by Bellin. He just saw the, f actually, well, it looks like Bellin and uh, Bart was able to fall on, on it as well. Um, it looked like uh, the play was designed to go off to the right because uh, Bellin was pulling and was able to assist at least in getting the ball back. It is chilly in Boise today. It rained most of last night, most of this morning, but it is clearing up. It's cold. The field, though, is dry as the Broncos look at a third and eight. Hendricks slips and will go down as Ryan Skinner greets him right at the midfield mark. I think for a moment, as I said, the field was dry. That slips what cost him the sack. Right. Uh, again, there was a lot of pressure coming up by way of the of the Vandals. Kevin Hill, the uh, safety on the blitz, came around to the left uh, Came around the left end, was partially blocked. You'll see, actually, he'll be on the right here. Number 42 and 44 are coming in there. Aaron Hurley does get a piece of him, but the pressure, by that time, the pocket has collapsed, and you see there's four Broncos greeting uh, Bart Hendricks to the blue turf. Bryson Gardner is the deep man awaiting the boot of this man, John Gonzalez, who on the season averaging about 38 yards. The stat most impressive, he's had 13 boots inside of the 20. Gardner takes it at the 10, and he's brought down by Mike Davison. Well, we've got 7-12 to go so far. Just a field goal. The Vandals leading it by three. We'll be back to Boise in a flash. The blue baseball hat. We're assuming he will not be able to play. Joey injured his thumb 10 days ago. All right. Uh, in fact, he, he injured it uh, playing in a basketball game uh, through a class. And that's devastating because he is such a fine quarterback whenever he enters the game. Eight coming in against Utah and also against New Mexico State to win the game for the Broncos off the benches. Joel Thomas has nowhere to go. Uh, interesting enough how Coach Cutter has kind of hit the cards this week saying, you'll have to wait and see who my starting quarterback is. Uh, maybe making the Vandals get as much as possible. Well, yeah, and it's not like the pros were the professional football teams. They need to say who is going to be or who is injured and what kind of injuries they have here. You can just keep, uh, keep it close to your vest not let the other coach know don't let uh, Chris Tormey know that uh, he's going to be facing Hendricks for the whole game coach Tormey in his four years 24 victories 19 losses 25 no doubt would be his biggest ever because it would send the Vandals into the humanitarian bowl the freshman firing it up toss on the way to Lacey is picked off Dempsey D's with his fifth interception he leads the big west and double D coming up with a big play as he's done all season long Joe at the beginning of the year he was number three on the depth chart all right uh, he is just really I mean especially last week with it or two weeks ago with those injured ankles we were wondering how he was going to respond after that injury and we were watching the the coverage all the way downfield he was all over Chris Lacey he did he was with him step for step down the field and he noticed that Lacey was turning around to make the catch so he turned around picked it off and Sandoval actually knocks him down right there his own teammate knocks him down but a great play by Dempsey Dees who has really come to the forefront uh, for the or for the Bronco defense Danielle Morgan may be the best ever at that position but this guy's got to be number two in the Big West. You saw that late pop yeah, there, so you're going to tack on 15 for number 41, and you see there his five interceptions, best in the Big West. So the Broncos not only get the interception, but the personal foul penalty 
pushes it to the 21. And so for the first time now, the Broncos knocking on the door. Right, huge break for the Broncos. We'll see if they capitalize close to the red zone. Aaron Hurley is the single setback. Wilson and Smith are the receivers. As Aaron carries it, picks up a couple of yards. Don't forget at the halftime of this game, we'll announce the Master Rooter fan of the game. We'll present them with a dirt cutter autographed football thanks to the fine folks at Master Rooter. Master Rooter, master of the trade. You know, Dave, even though the, the Bronco game plan is to run to the outside, you still need to pound it up the middle once in a while to keep that defense honest. And even though that was kind of a throwaway play for the Broncos, it may establish something later on. Joe with the ball at the 19, we can say it's inside the red zone, and uh, Coach Cutter very effective in there. As they fired up, the intended receiver was Jim Brecky, but it looked like Rodney and Jim kind of got their wires crossed there. Yeah, right, they were running, a, it, it was a designed uh, crossing pattern. It's supposed to throw the, the defensive backs off a little bit. Who do I cover when they come into my zone or whether they're in man-to-man -man defense sometimes it's, it's more difficult to cover a guy when they cross in the path of another one of their uh, offensive teammates and that time looked like uh, the throw was just a little bit overthrown Brecky was opening up as he went down the sidelines football is at the 19 coach cutter saying guys you need to get it down to the 11 for a first down on third and eight you see the Broncos fairly proficient in this game fires it across Rodney can't find the handle well, the pass was right on the money, but I think he took off before he got it. And thus, the Broncos will send in Todd Boom Boom Bel Castro to try the field goal. It's important to get points out of a turnover like that because you, you, you don't want to come away empty. And we'll see. Yeah, it was right in the hands of Rodney. We talked about he does have good hands, but um, uh, that time he dropped it. He did the same thing against New Mexico State. He dropped it one early. 36-yard field goal attempt for the senior who is perfect this year under 40 yards. 8 of 15. The kick is on the way for Boom Boom, and he missed it. Bel Castro, the first time he has missed one inside of 40, saying, hey, Mr. Official, I think it was good. Can't argue with the guy in stripes. We'll be back. The Vandals leading it by a field goal. Castro so upset. Look at the upright on the right-hand side of your screen. Was it good or why? Well, the official has to judge the trajectory of the ball as it goes over the top of the goalpost. And yeah, Boom Boom say, wait a minute, that looked good to me. Remember the football and the official, the official stands directly under that upright. And he's kind of got to draw an imaginary line. Regardless, the Vandals have the football. It's on the 20. The give is to Joel Thomas. What would you call him, a super, super senior? <laughs> yeah, he's had uh, a few extra years, sixth year senior. Usually you don't, uh, usually you're there a long time just for five years, but uh, Joel has seen it all. Last year he surpassed Sheridan May, or I should say last week is the all-time leading rusher in Vandal history. And the numbers, uh, 3,800 yards coming into this football game. Strongest man on the Vandal football team. I said, have you ever benched 500 yards, uh, 500 yards, 500 pounds? 490 is the best you could do. Oh, yeah, come on, you <laughs> win. Second down at five after Thomas picks up half of a first down. Welsh will throw it. He gets hit just as he releases it and batted away by Damian Schilling. And Damian's kind of the unheralded guy who's kind of quiet over in the corner, and he steps up and makes the big play. Uh, Damian had one of his uh, best games three weeks ago against Nevada where he was... Uh, he was on Jeff Noisy for much of the game, and here he's going to have another difficult afternoon as the Vandals have many wide receivers to go to. But boy, just he talk about elevating your play as the season has come along. He's much like Jeff puts here. He has really come along, uh, especially in the latter half of the season. He stepped for step there and knocked it away. Good pass break up. Schilling is a, a junior from Vancouver, Washington. Ethan Jones is going to be a pretty good receiver for the Vandals down the road. But right there, Damian Tony Molesson. Pass is caught across the middle, and that should be enough for the first down. As the Vandals running the passing game, compliments of uh, John Welsh, and uh, Jones making the catch. Ethan Jones, a, a freshman, uh, cut, just goes right underneath the Bronco zone, and you see he's wide open. There was a couple of receivers downfield. Most of the Bronco defenders had fallen back, and it was just underneath the coverage, but far enough to get a first down. Joe, what is so special about this game is, is the history and the people you run into. Uh, Lyle Smith, the magnificent coach, as we see the substitution pattern there as they sneak three off, three on. This time they show the running package. Single setback is Joel Thomas. 
Thomas will take the ball and has a lot of running room if Schilling can drag him down and does so, but not before little Joel picks up 16 yards. And Joe, that was kind of a reverse on the substitution. Normally we see him in the running package and then sneak three receivers out of the field. Let's see if we can take a look at that on the replay that, uh, well, actually, this is what we saw against Utah State. Take a look there at the bottom of your screen, the circle. Those are players coming onto the field, and they've already called the play in the huddle, and they just come out, and they just line up on the line of scrimmage. That resulted in a big play that helped uh, the Vandals uh, beat Utah State. And that's something Dirk Cutter talked about. In fact, he used that very film there all week long to help his players be ready for the quick substitution. So Thomas picks up 15 and a first down, 344 to go here in the first half. They give it, or I should say first quarter, give it to Thomas who gets up to the 50. Joe, some coaches don't like it. They say, you're really pushing the intent of the rule. Coach K, though, says, I don't mind it. Well, he thinks it's a, it's a good ploy. What it does, what it's designed to do is to throw you the defense off. They see the personnel out there. Okay, all of a sudden, you come up to the line of scrimmage, and you've got three different players out there. The one we saw just two plays ago was now it's a running package. They had three wide receivers in there. They all come, and here it comes again. Here comes the substitution comes. pattern. The band's thinking, okay, what are you doing? and they sneak in five receivers. They did just the opposite of what we saw last time. This time they come out, run, and then throw it up deep. Ethan Jones trying to go up. Dempsey D's almost at his sixth interception. Jones ended up being the defensive back there. Right, now keep in mind that the Broncos have had two weeks to prepare for this type of uh, offensive ploy that the Vandals uh, used. And that time, when we saw those players come in, you looked at all the defensive backs of the Broncos, they all adjusted. Generally, what's gonna happen is you're gonna get two on one or some sort of mismatch. All of the Broncos adjusted. Uh, Dempsey Dees has great one-on-one -on -one coverage with er and here, here it is coming in. See, look at all the players coming off the field. Other players standing from the sideline just get, and get right up to the line of scrimmage for a play. You call it controlled chaos. Third and eight, the Vandals are one of two on conversions on third down. Welsh back to pass. He's going to go deep against Schilling in cover. And David Schilling has the interception. So Schilling picks it off, his first interception, and he's got running room along the sidelines and a big turnover as the Broncos pick it up and run it back to the 32-yard line. Well, obviously, the Vandals think they can pick on the corners of the Broncos, and so far, two interceptions in the first half. This is the first time we've seen this all season from the Broncos secondary, and generally, it's Dempsey D's coming down with it. But you figure that Damian Schilling, as well as he's been playing, as well as he's been covering, is going to get one of these sooner or later. He already got his 11th pass breakup of the season. At that time, he was just running right along with the receiver. He has really come along in his pass coverage as the season has, has, has gone along. Just adjusted to the ball picked it off and another big turnover if you're gonna get your State. if you're gonna get your first interception Joe what better game to do it in so the Broncos with the football you see uh, Welsh running over to try to make the stop as we go back to live action Aaron Hurley maybe picks up a couple of yards before he is stopped very impressed with the corners and I think a lot of people we're really down on the corners. The MCDs, Damian Schilling, and Coach Cutter said, hey, stick with these guys, stick with them, because next year they're going to be the two best in the league. Well, you see the turnovers, and boy, that's that can, in a big game like this, between two very evenly matched teams, that can generally uh, turn, the, turn the game one way or the other. But so far, Broncos need points. Aaron Hurley picking up a yard, makes it second and nine. The screen pass to Jim Brecky, the senior from Capitol, playing in his last Bronco Vandal game. Gets it across the midfield mark and a big pickup for number 88. You know, I think Coach Cutter saw this work against the Vandals uh, put by Nevada. Nevada ran this not only against the Vandals, but also ran it for a touchdown against the Broncos. You just drag your tight end clear across the field. A linebacker is not really going to stay with him, and there he is wide open on the side. There wasn't even anybody within five yards of Brecky when he made the catch. So far, Broncos looking the way of Brecky twice so far in this game. The senior who played for Steve Vogel at Capital I was a wonderful Bronco linebacker gets the first down and here's Aaron Hurley and Hurley's got one man to beat trying to punch it in for the touchdown 46 yards Aaron Hurley puts the Broncos on the scoreboard wow, away speed from Aaron Hurley a fantastic play and you can 
you can uh, pop that one up to Jeremy Mankins on the play. Look at number 61. He's the right guard. He pulls, and look at Hurley. He's just going to go walk right up his back, read his block on Skinner, which just not blows the open or the hole right open, right up the middle, and then just squirts it out to the outside for a long, long touchdown and a big momentum shift for the Broncos. So the point after attempt by Todd Belcastro. And just like that, the Broncos have the lead. The 46-yard run by Aaron Early of the 30,000-plus on their feet. They're drawing up the lead, 7-3. The Broncos, they did it in three plays. They traveled 68 yards. Aaron Hurley, by the way, with that run, he now finds himself just 60 yards away from going over 1,000. And Joey's moving up in the record book. Right, yeah, that uh, that's his 10th touchdown of the season. That moves him up in the fourth place all time for rushing touchdowns in a season for Mr. Hurley. Bel Castro boots the football to Lacey, who will let that one go out of the end zone. I don't know if he let it or it was just a case of the way the football was spinning around and round. Don't forget, at the conclusion of today's game, Joe and I will single out the most significant play as our play of the game, brought to you as always by Snake River Yamaha, the Treasure Valley's Yamaha Superstore. Well, so far that we've seen the Vandals with the, that uh, sort of trick play from the sidelines, and so far the Broncos have, they, like I said, Dave, they worked on it for two weeks. They tried to simulate that in practice, that sort of situation, and, uh, and at least uh, early on it worked well because the, they've been able to stop the Vandals and keep good uh, coverage. John Wells still at quarterback. Keep in mind, the Vandals have had three starters at that spot this season. Wells fires it out to Ryan Prestamonico, who is the reigning Big West Player of the Week. Presto last week had three touchdowns, only six catches. That's a pretty good uh, ratio. Right, and he only has six touchdowns uh, for the entire season, so he got half of them just last week against New Mexico State. And uh, he's dangerous, and he's very good at breaking tackles. The winning touchdown against New Mexico State last week was uh, one of that variety where Presto was able to just shed a couple of tacklers and then just race into the end zone. If you want good Italian food, you go to the Presto house. <laughs> yes, right. Ryan knows, Ryan knows uh, Linguini. Dad is, a, I guess Dad is a fabulous Italian chef. We're at the 133 mark of the first quarter. The Broncos leading at 7-3 after the run by Aaron Hurley. And so far, Aaron has stepped up. Remember two weeks ago, he went against Envis Manns. Today, he goes up against number one, and right now, he's the star. Again, it's one of those situations. We said it two weeks ago. It's like, you know, which, which player is the featured back in this game? We were all talking about Denvis Manns, and Aaron Hurley just had an exceptional game. And so far, he's well on his way to 100 yards. Again, the substitution. Remember, you can't have more than 12 players in the huddle, and all the players have to start inside of the yard markers. Then they can go out. Pass is intended for Willie Alderson. What about John Welsh? Uh, he has started in four games, but keep in mind, Greg Robertson has started in two, Ed Dean in five, and right now he's four of ten with two interceptions. Right. Well, so far, it looks like he's a, maybe a little bit uh, rattled uh, being in front of uh, the 30,000-plus here at Bronco Stadium. Uh, but generally, uh, someone like Coach Torme will give him a series or two to get settled down. This may be the key series for him, though. If he doesn't produce on this seri series, uh, they have two capable backups. Greg Robertson would be the man to come in, the transfer from Ricks Junior College, who beat Utah State earlier in the season. Second down and 10. Travis Stombaugh, the big tight end, is in motion. They pass it. Dempsey Dees nearly had an interception. I believe Chris Lacey slipped for just a moment on the turf. And John Welsh is not having a ball game to remember. No, and, and it doesn't help. And the conditions don't help. His receivers are having problems uh, running their patterns. And then uh, it's, it's been those deep balls that he's thrown that uh, have been picked off. So now they're concentrating on just those little five or ten yard chunks at, at a time. And so far, and even that's not working at this point. Third long. So Welsh, who grew up on the south side of Chicago, rooting for the Cubbies, trying to figure out a way to get the Vandals going. Gets ready to throw on third down, goes to the big tight end, and Jeff Davis had quite a challenge going up against Travis Stombaugh. And Stombaugh, or check that, Mike Roberg goes 6'4, 260 pounds. Jeff Davis, maybe six foot, 194 pounds. Well, Roberg, uh, he uh he used to be a, a tight end before they moved him to the other side of the field. So you can see he is just a big load, 260 pounds. You figure the Vandals figuring that he's just going to rumble his way for the first down. But Jeff, making sure it doesn't go too far, tackle him around the ankles. Mike O'Neill to boot it. 
averaging on the season about 40 yards a kick. Damon Schilling is the deep man who has an interception on the season. His return's going about seven yards a pop. Schilling takes it at the 15. There's a flag. I don't think they gave Damian enough room to catch the football. Either that or they were really watching closely uh, the block of Greg Sasser from uh, the Broncos down there. And I, I'm not sure whether it was enough room or whether Sasser maybe got a hand in the back or something like that because they were really watching him going down the field. We'll wait for the call. Broncos leading at 7 to 3, 13 clicks on the clock, and uh, it is against. Looks like it's against the band. Let's see it again. Did they, you've got to give him a circumference of a couple of yards all the way around, and I don't think they gave him enough. Who was that down there, Chris Lacey? Yeah, it looked like he was right off, looked like he was right off the side, and uh, practically just looking right, right at him, uh, less than a yard or two away. Coming up at the end of the game, Joe and I will announce the work here, Northwest player of the game, Work Care Northwest today's solution for workers' compensation risks. As Chris Tormey looks at the scoreboard, finds himself trailing by four points with 13 seconds to go in the first quarter. They fake it on the end of round to Wilson. Hurley might pick up a yard as the Maytag clock complements of Thompson's Maytag shows us that will be the last play of the quarter. So you paint quarter number one in blue as the Broncos lead it seven to three. First quarter stats fairly even on total yards. Broncos with 100, Broncos with 90, or uh, Idaho with 95, but the key is quarterback Johnny Welsh, 5 of 12, 62 yards, two interceptions, and the Broncos trying to take advantage of his turnover. Hendricks shows the end around, the option to Hurley, who has the first down and more. We have not seen that twist all season long. I'm not sure, Joe, can, if, if your microphone's working right now, but uh, Aaron Hurley picking it up and uh, check, check. picking up the air. There you go, Joe. They're just checking you out, seeing how you're doing. Nice run by Aaron Hurley. So Hurley picking up the first down and more. Remember, he needs 60 yards to get the mark of 1,000. Hendricks back to pass. He's got Ronnie Pound. Pound bobbles it and cannot hang on to it. And you know, the folks in Weezer told me Ron was actually a tackle, offensive tackle, and he was a better player as an offensive tackle. But as a linebacker, he never dropped anything. So Pound with the incomplete pass, he had big yards in front of him, brings up a second down and 10. Dave Tester along with Joe Hughes, hoping you're enjoying this sports exclusive on Channel 6 in Boise and across Idaho as well. 1447 as we move it into the second quarter. BSU with the lead seven to three. Second down and ten. Antoine Wilson with the catch, and number eight's got the first down. And one of the keys is as you watch this game, Rodney Smith, number five. He's a big play guy, but if Antoine Wilson makes a big play and Corey Nelson makes a big play, that kind of frees it up for Rodney. Right, and someone like uh, Antoine Wilson, we already saw how he'll run the ball, he will catch the ball, and you know, Dave, he'll throw the ball. He's got the triple threat out there for the Broncos, so keep your eyes open on number eight. He's dangerous all over uh, that offensive field. So the Broncos with another first down, marching it into Vandal territory. Hendricks passes it, it's complete, and just like that, we talk about the two unheralded receivers setting the table for maybe the best receiver in the Big West, Rodney Smith. Boy, Rodney uh, maybe felt a little bit down about his season coming into the last couple of games against Nevada and against New Mexico State, but boy, has he really poured it on. Four touchdowns, 200 yards in his last outing. He dropped the first one that went his way, but you see, he's starting to come around making sure. I don't expect to see a dropped ball like we saw early on. Dennis Gibbs with the stop. After Rodney picks up four yards, and it's a second down. BSU going with the I formation. That's Corey Nelson running to the bottom of your screen. Aaron Hurley with a big hole, and Hurley appears to have enough for the first down. 
why is Aaron playing his best football right now? Boy, maybe it's because he's 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 injury free. He's generally had a, a lot of injuries throughout his career, but uh, as the season has wore on, Aaron has really poured it on as well. And it's hard not to run that well when you have a hole that huge to run through. That time, uh, Coach Cutter drew it up on the chalkboard to blast open a hole through the middle of that tough Vandal flex defense, and Aaron exploits it. Coach Cutter said that was his biggest goal this season was for Aaron Hurley to play the entire season healthy and he says it's been a pleasant surprise on third down not quite a yard and Hendricks keeps it and Ryan Skinner was right there to greet him he has to get it to the 35 yard line or maybe the 34 and three quarters well it looked like he was able to get right over the top uh, it looks like from where they're marking it marking it right on the on the yard line so that would be a first down Skinner reading it well well, he just, he, you knew with uh, just uh, less than half a yard that uh, it might be a sneak or just a handoff straight up the middle, and Skinner was there to meet him, but uh, just not quite enough stop on the, in, on the part of Skinner. Number 44, the heart and soul, who, if you remember, a year ago stepped up after the game was over and said this will never happen again, referring to the Broncos defeating the Vandals. Right now, though, he trails 7-3. to three. Antoine Wilson with his second carry of the ball game. Picks up 12 yards and another first down. So Antoine now has 13 carries on the year. He's trying to get over 100 yards this season. Yeah, look at him put on the speed. That was well-timed play because he was in motion, already sprinting. So by the time he handed the ball off, or Bart handed the ball off to him, he was already in full speed. Was able to burst out around the end of a good 10-yard game for Wilson. Yeah, he's excited about that. 11 rushes, 55 yards. That was coming in uh, to this game. And like you said, Dave, he's already working his way, hopefully maybe even doubling that. Now, Joe, he can he can catch the ball. He can run with it. Can he throw it? Yeah, well, he, threw, he likes throwing the way of Bart Hendricks. One of three on the season passing as Hurley lowers his head for a couple of yards. Broncos again knocking on the door. They've been inside the 20 earlier in this game. Todd Belcastro trying a 38-yard field goal, missing that. Coach Cutter talking to Brian Harson, relaying the play. And you see Nate Sparks right behind him in the baseball hat. And we told you earlier, Nate probably will not play. See him with the orange gloves on. Injured thumb. He did that in a freak accident at a basketball class of all places. Boy, yeah, you, you'd expect all the hits he takes in football for that to happen. But no, it's with the round ball. I hope he gets an A in that class. <laughs> Second down and six. Football's at the 18. Option. And Hendricks lowers his head, but Matt Jasek's going to win that battle. It almost looked like option and then maybe pass the football. Right, uh, which is a good way to go off of the option. You show the run. It's like sh it's like throwing a play action pass, except for it's your quarterback who's doing the playing or the play action. This time, it looked like he he just knew he didn't have a chance to pitch the ball, and that play wasn't going anywhere. It's a situation where okay, this this play didn't work. We just go down to the turf. So the Broncos on the season on third down as they are faced here are 35 percent here on a third and six let's see if they can better that percentage Hendricks in trouble and again inside the 20 the Vandal defense holds up let's see if uh, Bel Castro this time can step up and make the play big Mao Tosi who plays basketball for Dave Farrar of course the Vandals were in town playing hoop earlier this week Dave Farrar said I don't think he's going to be uh, is big a name in hoop because he played football and everybody's preparing for it. Well, boy, he's just a, a big load, though, and uh, tough to stop right through the middle right there. 37-yard attempt. Boom, boom. Kicks it up and misses it again. Belcastro, who coming into this game was perfect inside the 40, now goes 0 for 2. The scoreboard says the same, 7-3. get the football the numbers tell us all about the freshman John Welsh two interceptions in this game just five of 12 we have a feeling that we may see Greg Robertson in here as he passes it complete to Ethan Jones and Jones picks up 11 yards and gets the first down and that's the best play probably to run to build up a quarterback's confidence oh absolutely Dave a screen pass is one of the easier ones to, to complete you just toss it out there to Ethan Jones he, and it's not a way downfield he just looks off to the right tosses back to the left no uh, uh, no defenders nearby and he's got a couple of blockers to help out the play so Jones getting the first down Welsh getting a completion Played prep school for a year. 
He is a quarterback with an attitude. That's how Ryan Skinner describes this freshman. Handing the football off. Vandals like to run a lot of misdirection, a lot of, I don't know if it's trickery, but Phil Early, who is the offensive coordinator, he likes to do it all. Well, yeah, he's uh, he likes to be as versatile as possible. That means running it up the middle, running it to the outside, using those uh, trick formations that they like to run off of the sidelines. And this time it's just smash mouth football up the middle for Joel Thomas. Joel Thomas with the carry playing in his, he told me, hopefully not last game, but hold, uh, his last BSU-Idaho game. There's Tormey looking on. As you see the numbers on the ground, Broncos' Aaron Hurley winning that battle in a big way. And speaking of battles, what about the two defensive ends for the Broncos, in particular number 69, Mike Malloy, and Andy Bennett. The bookends have done a nice job as the season's progressed. Right. Uh, someone like Andy Bennett uh, has caused, he leads the team in caused fumbles, and some of those have been big caused fumbles, like in the last home game the Broncos had here against Utah State. Andy Bennett came up big, and you're right. It's been uh, the bookends have really, Mike Malloy as well, four and a half sacks, four tackles for loss. The Florida native has also played well for the Broncos, unheralded though they may be. We've, interesting enough, Joe, we got two guys from Florida. Uh, one for the Broncos in Mike Malloy and Jeff Townsley for the Vandals from Miami. I guess the question, how do you get from Miami to, <laughs> to Idaho? I, I guess in an airplane uh, well, or a to. bus. Well, yeah, <laughs> unless it's the charter Vandal airplane. The Anchorage plane to Lewiston. Welsh wants to go up deep to Ethan Jones, and Jones is battling with Schilling, and right now, you'd have to call number 10 the MVP for the Broncos. Well, Damian Schilling, once again, step for step with the, the receiver. He came into the game leading uh, the Broncos with, with pass breakups with 10. This, has been, this will be his second of the game already. Man-on-man -man coverage. He has no, no help behind him, and look how he was just step for step. Here comes the ball. And it's very difficult to catch it when you've got four hands going for the ball. Schilling wins that battle again. Joe, we got a question. Will someone please win the $20,000? Just keep watching. Claudia Weatherman and Don Nelson will take a lucky fan to the 10-yard line and let them pass for cash at the half of this ball game. And it's carried on the ground by Jerome Thomas, Ross Ferris, tossing him out of bounds. Joe, I'm excited about that. Normally, we pass for $10,000. The folks at AirTouch helping us out with that. We popped in 10 more thousand dollars. It's out of your salary, by the way. Oh, yeah. That's right. That's right. Well, I guess I won't be eating for the rest of the year. But here we go. Pass for cash. And uh, you remember, we have yet to give that away. But the closest one was the first one out of the game, which was maybe eight inches low. That's going to be a lot of fun. So fans, stay tuned for that. At the half of our Bronco Vandal football game, third down and eight. And the Vandals have struggled on third down. This time they go across, incomplete, as Jeffrey Townsley, the intended receiver, just let that one slip through his hands. Well, and it was maybe a little bit overthrown as well, and, and Welsh, he, he's looking now. He looked on that play like a freshman. He looked almost a little bit scared because when he threw it, he was on his back foot. He saw the pressure coming up. He knew he didn't have a running back in there to help block, and he just like got rid of it as quick as he could, and it didn't work out. So Mike O'Neill will punt it to this guy, Damian Schilling, who right now we think has had the best football game of anyone on the turf. Schilling's going to let that one go. And just as I give him an accolade, he lets it roll out at the three-yard line. And when we come back, that's where the Broncos will have it with eight and a half minutes to go in the first half, leading it by four. In Bogus Basin, where we said it's almost time to go skiing, well, we got a football game to play. Broncos with the football after the punt that puts it on the four-yard line. So running back Aaron Hurley's no longer in the blue. He's in the orange. Handoff goes to Hurley. He's greeted right by Ryan Skinner, and there is vintage Ryan Skinner football. Right. Uh, boy, he just he fills the hole. He's kind of a, a roving middle linebacker where he just sits there in the middle and reads which way the play is going to go, and then it's his job to fill the hole. He filled it quite nicely there. Gene Blameyer, BSU's athletic director, uh, stepping in to our booth and asking that uh, we wish a big get well to Wilson Vaughn, who's watching this football game. So, Wilson... Uh, get well soon. That's an order right for Gene Blaine. That's right, coming straight from the top. Second down and 10. 
give is to Hurley. You know, a lot of times people will say, now, why, why do you just run little dives up the middle and you don't throw the football here? But that's the safest thing. Well, yeah, and Hurley, you remember, he, he, the last couple of years, he has been a fullback. It was only this year that they converted him to a tailback position. And so he's very uncommon, very used to running straight up the middle. And they may not get the first down here. They'll probably, I mean, they'll, they'll come awfully close. But uh, what it does is it just gives you a little bit of breathing room because they were right up with their backs against the end zone. Broncos right at 50% in third down conversions. Three of six here on third and six. They give it to Hurley. And Hurley pushing his way up for a first down. What a ball game Aaron Hurley's had so far. Well, yeah, and, and what a ball game the, the offensive line is having as well. That time, boy, these guys, keep in mind that they are just one of the largest offensive lines in the country, not just in the Big West or in the West, but in the country. And look at the hole that he has. Folks like uh, Jermaine Bell, and look at him just pushing and shoving. And, boy, you get that big 300-pound mass moving against you. And it's, hard, it's hard to keep going the other direction. Aaron Hurley, by the way, is four yards away from crossing the 100-yard mark. Coach Cutter couldn't have asked for a better scenario. The senior with 96 yards picking up the first down. They give it to Hurley again and fumble. Well, the official said he was down, and we actually heard the whistle as uh, Matt Jasic coming up there, and that was the case of the official saying, I, I just blew it a hair too soon. Right, because it seemed like it was a bit of an early whistle there, and that would have been a fumble because it was just as he was coming down that the ball uh, popped out of there. But like you said, Dave, we heard the whistle. I think everyone at home heard the whistle as well, and you can't just keep running the play after the, the ref has blown the whistle. So Hurley will lose three yards on the carry, and Matt Jasic and that linebacking crew looking at a second and 13. Broncos with four receivers in the pack. Now run the middle screen to Antoine Wilson. And it appeared like the Vandals had seen that play a time or two, as Bryson Gardner said, not on my territory. That's right. He came in there, and he was the second leading tackler for the Vandals a year ago. And he's third coming in uh, to this game. And you see, he was he was not to be fooled on that play. He also has four interceptions on the year, which at first had him tied with Dempsey D's coming into this game. But uh, as we've seen already in the first half, Dempsey has gone ahead of him with the interceptions. You see the numbers on Bart Hendricks, who a year ago in this game, 378 yards and three touchdowns. Sophomore's done a magnificent job. He's got running room if he just wants to tuck the football. And I think he just waited a second too long to make that decision. Right. Uh, he was able to get uh, quite a bit of yards uh, out of the play. I mean, positive yardage. And Aaron Hurley came up and made a nice block to try and help his quarterback out. But uh, it was a little bit of indecision, like you said there, Dave. And maybe if he go cut straight up field instead of, boy, look at the block that Hurley put uh, there. That was a... Wow, that was fantastic. Right on Bryson Gardner, who we were just talking about how tough a player that is. And Aaron Hurley is maybe the toughest. And you see Coach Cutter saying, hey, maybe you should have tucked it and run a little bit early. We don't know exactly what he has to say there, but uh, certainly they wanted a better outcome from that third down play. So Gonzalez will boot the ball from his own 10-yard line. Vern Bernard will wait at the 37, and Gonzalez did not like something. I don't think there's enough players out there for the Broncos. And Coach Cutter, the look says it all. We'll be back right after this. Where the Broncos lead at 7 to 3. John Gonzalez will boot it to Vern Bernard, who on October 17th against Utah State ran one back 91 yards. The decisive play in the win for the Vandals against the Aggies. Yeah, and that really turned uh, the game around for the Vandals in that uh, their first conference win against Utah State. Bernard goes all the way back to the 31, and he's got uh, some running room along the sidelines, and he gets it up to the 42. Brian Johnson coming up to make the stop. Well, it looks like uh, John Welsh is still in at quarterback. Well, uh, you know, Coach Tormey is giving him uh, every opportunity to turn the offensive uh, production around. And uh, judging from the final play that he threw, it looked like he's getting a little antsy back there. And maybe he's starting to doubt himself. You talked about the screen pass that he threw to try to boost his confidence. Well, it didn't do too much in the last series. So who knows how much longer he has before maybe they pull the trigger on uh, another quarterback. Welsh with two interceptions in this football game. Fortunately for his team, the Broncos only lead it by four with four and a half minutes to go. 
If you're going to be roommates with somebody and you're a quarterback, Rick DeMulling's a pretty good guy to do so, and that is the offensive lineman for this guy. And Johnny Wells said, you know what, Rick takes pretty good care of me, and my mom makes him brownies. <laughs> Hey, nothing, I think that's pretty good thinking, don't you? Hey, you need to soften up uh, that offensive line to you because they're covering your back, Fire they're covering the your front. Offside on the defense. Five-yard penalty remains first down. In fact, even on that play, I don't think uh, Welsh had any intention of running the play. They just snapped the ball to catch the Broncos offside. So it's a five-yard penalty against Coach Cutter's Broncos. Coach K with his uh, four kids. The entire family's here watching the football game. This time, Welsh will tuck it and run, and this is what some say he does best, and he gets the first down. What about Welsh compared to the likes of Greg Robertson, who is not so agile? Well, he isn't, and uh, in fact, this may be what they're looking for down the road for the Vandal program is some more designed running plays for the likes of Welsh, who is very athletic. You see him tuck the ball, and he, he's, he looks awfully comfortable running, and he can take the hit as well. He's a young kid, uh, a cocky kid, you, you could say, because he's he's out there to win. He's out there, to, he's talking it up with uh, his defensive players. I know Ryan Skidder talked about, hey, he'll talk it up with the best of them, even myself. I'm wondering about the quarterback situation. Ed Dean from Rimrock was the starter at the beginning of the season. He started against Eastern Washington, Washington State. Greg Robertson worked his way in there, so it's been kind of a three-quarterback show as the pass is complete to Presta Monaco, who stumbled, and I believe they're going to mark it inside of the first down marker. So he'll be about a uh, half a yard shy of picking up the first down. Ryan Prestamonico, as I told you, Big West Player of the Week. 36 catches on the season, six touchdowns, three of those last week. Take a look at the open room he had when he slipped. He was going to split the defense back there, and uh, the, the slip kept him from getting the first down and much more. He might have been challenging for the end zone on that play, but a little slick turf took care of that. Presto, just a junior guys they're expecting big things from come next season. Travis Stombaugh in motion. They give it to Joel Thomas, and Thomas just runs over the top of people to get the first time. First time we've called uh, Joel's number for a while. Right. Uh, you mentioned, Dave, how he bench presses 490 pounds, and boy, that's that's more than two times his weight. It's actually like almost two and a half times his own body weight. Take a look at him when he comes up to the, the huddle there. He actually stands in the back of the huddle, and he's so small, he's like... I, he must have great hearing back there because he can't see the lips moving of the quarterback. He just has really good hearing to hear the play and knows where to go. The offensive coordinator for the Broncos, Brent Guy, says he's bigger than he was a couple of years ago. He likes to just run it up the middle and over the top of people. Thomas, the very best in Vandal history, carries it again. The idea, I'm guessing, running the football is with 2.59 to go. Vandals want to use as much clock of this first half as they can. Well, and they have a good drive going as well. They've, they've actually been able to complete a few passes to the likes of Ryan Prestamonico. And, and not that you don't certainly don't want to take Joel Thomas out of your offensive scheme. Uh, he only stands five foot six, but we've seen time and time again how strong he runs, the good vision that he has. He can bounce to the outside. He's just such an all-around threat. You got to keep going to him. But to go coach with John L. Smith after the season's over, <laughs> he may find himself playing against John L. Smith if the Vandals win this game. Uh, may face Louisville in the Humanitarian Bowl. Welsh will keep it, and he's got a lot of running room up the middle, and he gets the first down. Well, good. Vi we were just talking about the vision of Joel Thomas. There was good vision that time by Welsh to see how the op how the open of the f or the middle of the field was opening up right in front of him. His receivers were covered, and one was double covered. But he notices, wow, look at that big hole right there. I think I can get the first down, and he does. Good running again by Welsh. We've seen it a couple of times on this uh, series. Derek Burrell coming up to make the stop. And they're trying to see exactly how close it is. Don't forget our game clock is always brought to you by Thompson's Maytag, the dependability place for all your home appliances. How close is he to a first down? About that close. <laughs> Not quite. But again, Welsh, uh, Welsh getting some good rushing yards on this uh, drive along with Joel Thomas, and uh, this has been the most productive offensive drives that, we, that we've seen for the Vandals. One of five, Joe, on third down conversions. It brings up a third down, not quite a yard. Well, I don't think there's any question that it, it, this is either going to be uh, Welsh or just hand it off to, to Joel Thomas right up the middle. 
if you got to pick one or the other. Come on, Joe. Okay, I'll say Welsh. <laughs> <laughs> but the, again, the Coach Troyer, I'd be thinking he's taken a lot of hits already. Oh, and here comes the substitution pattern. It's what you would call controlled chaos, and this substitution setting up the running package. Three tight ends into this lineup. Third down and literally inches. Thomas with the ball, and I think they stopped him. Johnny Reideman, the junior who's played in three of these games, stepped up and delivered the flipper. Now what do you do on fourth down? Boy, now it's a big call. John Reideman just coming, the junior, just he has made a living in the backfield uh, against uh, other offenses this uh, season. And you see, he just pushes up ahead. You see Bobby Setzer there as well around the legs. And I tell you what, Dave, uh, it would have been better for Welsh to have gone straight forward on that play. There was nobody uh, right over his center. Could have got the first down that way. 37-yard attempt for Ben Davis, who's done the only scoring thus far for the Vandals. Boot is on the way. It is good. And it has cut the lead to one. But the Bronco defense has to feel like they won that battle. Oh, absolutely. Third and uh, less than a yard. And you know that the likes of Reidman are saying, hey, we held them. We, we, they have yet to get into the end zone against our defense, which uh, has been uh, remarkably good against the run and uh, not too bad a, a scoring defense as well. Johnny Reidman, who a uh, pretty good uh, base player, saying, uh, bring me a pizza. Yeah, pass some of that up here, will you? Well, I know we're in the midst of a wonderful football game, but don't forget the best basketball in Idaho is on Channel 6 in December. Look at this lineup. Boise State at Indiana. Can't wait to see Bobby Knight on Channel 6. Uh, Washington State taking on Idaho, and then Boise State at Idaho State. This is just kind of the appetizer as we get into the Big West season. The best basketball alive on Channel 6. Dave, will you make sure that Bobby Knight has all the chairs bolted to the floor? before that game. No, I don't. I want him to Oh, you want chair. him to do that. Yeah, but you might take out a Bronco or two <laughs> in the process. The general, one of our fishing buddies. <laughs> so BSU with the lead, 7-6, to six, but the numbers on uh, Ben Davis on his jersey says it all, right? A pair of threes? <laughs> a pair of threes, absolutely. That's a double, double tray for him. So Davis will boot it deep into the end zone. Shanad Hearts will let it roll for a touchback, and that's where the Broncos will have it first and 10 at the 20. Seven plays for the Vandals, uh, a nice drive, probably with the exception of on third and short. Maybe they out-tricked himself with all the substitution going on. Well, yeah, and again, Dave, uh, we mentioned that you're right ahead of the center of Welsh. It almost looked like he could have just audible to himself to just push ahead for that first. You know, it's hard not to give the ball to Joel Thomas because he's so, so productive in the backfield, and he's the best uh, a career rusher the Vandals have ever had. So it's hard to doubt that play, but that's where it stalled. So with a minute and two clicks remaining on the clock, you wonder what the Broncos are going to do. Well, Coach Cutter in past history, he's like to hang it up deep, maybe show a couple of runs, and then go deep to Corey Nelson. Aaron Hurley with the football, and Aaron's going to pick up about seven yards before he is brought down. Of course, uh, Corey Nelson has one of the longest pass receptions from scrimmage. Remember, earlier in the season, similar to this, run, 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 and then they hit Corey, and he was off to the races. Right, now it was 79 yards, and incidentally, that was the only touchdown that Corey Nelson has scored this season. I know he would like to get back into the end zone one more time before his senior season is over. And how about this? Aaron Hurley just going over the 100-yard mark on that carry. Just needs 20 more yards to pass the 1,000-yard mark of the season. And again, they give it to Hurley, and Hurley gets the first down and more as he lowers his head and pulls it all the way up to the 43. What's this passing stuff you're talking about, Dave? <laughs> Look at that. They're just going to give it to Big, or, or well, you, can, you could call him Big, big uh, not in stature, but Big uh, certainly uh, as far as rushing statistics go. Look at this again. They've been trying that left side with Jermaine Bell, and going, now they're going with the, with the uh, no huddle. I'm going to call this one to Corey Nelson, who's directly in front of us. No luck to Corey Nelson. They were going to Rodney, but we saw Corey Nelson down here, and we thought he is off to the races. Well, they're running out of time in this one because only 11 seconds left to go, and you think that they would like to get at least down to the... Well, I don't know if they would try another field goal right now with the way that uh, Todd Bell Castro. You see the play coming in. That's the best way to bring it in. Just say, hey, Bart, come here. Run this one. Run. Okay. 
Tell Corey to go deep and hang it up. <laughs> Corey, by the way, one of the fastest men on this football team. In fact, track coaches here saying, Corey, we want you to go out and run the 200, maybe making the NCAAs. Hendricks here. back, goes up to Jeff Putz here. Putz here gets it into Vandal territory. 25-yard reception to Putz here, and Bart Hendricks says, let's use a timeout. So with five clicks on the clock, I would think that the Broncos would need to get one more completion before they bring Boom Boom Bell Castro out, who is good up to about, what would you say, Joe, 55, 56 yards? Right. Well, we've seen him in practice before, and generally uh, that's been in a little bit warmer temperatures. And a lot of times when it's cooler like this, the ball's not going to carry quite as well, especially with as much moisture as in the air. So I don't know if they would try one uh, 55 yards with the Boom Boom, even though, uh, well, especially considering he's missed two field goals already today. I don't know if you'd call it irony or just dumb luck, but Bel Castro a year ago in this game in the dome, there he is right there, the man we call Boom Boom, belted a 50-yarder. Well, For again there, Dave, the key was it was the dome. It was uh, controlled conditions and, and not slick and uh, moist air out here. They're patting him on the helmet like he's going to run out and kick it. His longest this season, a 53-yarder. Uh, Bel Castro says, uh, I feel very confident. At the same time, he won't kid around with Coach Cutter. He'll say, I think I can make it, or don't even put me out there. Right. I think uh, with that very uh, field goal you're referring to, the 53-yarder earlier in that very game, uh, they had a situation where they could have gone for another 50-plus yard field goal, and Boom Boom said, hey, I don't think so. I don't know if I can do it because the wind is swirling. But here they go. They've called on uh, Boom Boom to come out and give it a go. Ironically enough, Boom Boom 0 for 2 in this game. Inside of 40, he was perfect. We'll call this one a 52-yard attempt. And I think the Vandals are going to take a timeout because they didn't know what Boise State was going to do. Because they were thinking maybe the same thing as we were. Maybe one pass play, maybe not. Wanted to see what kind of defense to come out with. Don't forget, coming up in about, uh, what, 15 seconds, we're going to pass for cash. $20,000 on the line, compliments of Channel 6 on your side and Air Touch Cellular. It's going to be kind of fun to see that. I know a lot of fans coming in here said, Dave, pick my name, pick my name. At least today, Claudia Weatherman and Don Nelson get to pick the they, name. They get to pick the name. Dave, with five seconds left uh, to go in the half, you know, it makes you wonder whether there would be enough time to do a, to run one play. The clock could certainly run at it on you so I think the, the Broncos are taking their best shot at points on the board a 10 to 6 lead is nothing to be ashamed about uh, going in uh, in Idaho Super Bowl would you be surprised if the Broncos now came out with Bart Hendricks and threw a quick pass I, I would be actually but you know what they might be thinking about is uh, we've seen fakes before we certainly saw uh, the Broncos get burned on a fake punt uh, by the Vandals on this very field two years ago I don't know if they've got a fake in the package that they want to run right now but the downside is pretty low Boom Boom Bel Castro played his high school football at Meade. A guy by the name of Jason Hansen kicked there too, so they've got a pretty good tradition. Bel Castro, who hit a 50 yarder a year ago, says, You know what? This is seeming like a lifetime <laughs> with another timeout. He's like, How many times do I have to get ready to kick this 52 yard field goal? And uh, again, he certainly, well, take a look, he is not happy about that situation. Like, how many timeouts can they call in a row? So Bell Castro, look, he's going to run over. He's going to get a couple he's of more kick a ball. He goes, hey, kick, hold that for me. Matt Sevieri, remember against the New Mexico State game, they had a little trouble with the snap and some of the questions, was it a fake, what was going on? Keep in mind, if something happens with the snap, they have what they call a hot number, and they say, Coach Cutter's getting a kick out of that. But <laughs> if they yell that number, or whether they say red or 27, that means you go into the passing mode. So boom, boom, trots out. Uh, the belt around his waist, if you're wondering what, the, all kickers wear that because uh, you put your hands in the back there to keep warm. Mm -hmm. And only a kicker would wear one of those. Right? <laughs> sure. <laughs> sure. Well, look, at this. you can see one on Matt's back as well. So there's more than one out there. Both teams with one timeout remaining in the half, but we think that will be the last timeout. So Bel Castro, as ready as you're ever going to be. <laughs> Wait a minute, they call a timeout. And the crowd loves this. <laughs> We're going to take a 30-second time out and be back to Bronco Stadium after this. See, now I know if you're at home, you're saying, no, no, no. I'd like to see the Broncos <laughs> use their last time out right here. 
I don't know if I've ever seen three timeouts taken all at once like that. Well, and the idea is simply this, Coach Tormey saying with only five seconds to go, I might as well use them all. It's a mind game. You're playing on Bel Castro. Coach Cutter, you saw him cheer just before the timeout. I think, though, <laughs> finally, we will see the 52-yard <laughs> attempt. The all-Big West booter trying to split the uprights 0 for 2 today. Bel Castro about a yard short on that one. Well, it would have brought the house down one way or the other, and Coach Cutter saying, you know what? We set it up. Why not go from there? And that's where we stand. The Broncos leading it by a point, 7-6. to six. Uh, BSU with the lead in this game. As Coach K heads over the sidelines, having a chat with uh, Bobby Setzer. We'll ask him exactly uh, if he's where he wants to be. And I would think so, Joe, in this situation, he's right on the money. Oh, yes, absolutely, Dave. I mean, it's a lead. That's exactly where they want to be, except for they'd like a little bit more. Coach Cutter, you're right Yo. where you want to be. You got the lead at the half. Well, yeah, we got the lead. We should have a bigger lead than we have. Uh, we're going to have to play a little better. Idaho's, Idaho's a good team, and it should probably be about 21-7 to 7 right now, but that's why Idaho's 7-3. and three. Okay, Bronco football coach Dirk Cutter. And, Joe, you got $20,000 on you? Yeah, here, let me get my wallet out, and I'll, I'll run down to the blue. All right, Claudia Weatherman, take it away. All right, congratulations to this crowd, the largest sporting event crowd ever assembled in the state of Idaho. You comprise the fifth largest city in the state right now. We got $20,000 to give away. Let's put on our cheering faces. Okay, meet Ryan Southern. Ryan's go for not ten, but twenty thousand dollars. Okay, here's the good news, bad news. Ryan played football. That's the good news. Bad news, he was wide receiver. Ryan, you ready? Yes, I am. Twenty thousand bucks. Uh, buy a nice normal deal. All right, take your time, but not too much time. here for Ryan. Thank you, Eric Touch. Thanks, All right, we well, got Ryan did his best to today. pick up the money. Bill runs over there, and we want to thank him, uh, Air Touch, for being a big part of the pass for cash. It's been a wonderful, oh, kind of a, a game within the game, Joe, and uh, Coach Cutter, speaking of the game, uh, that's what I like about Coach, is he's a perfectionist, but you know deep down he's happy that they've got the one-point lead because they haven't gone in the locker room for a while without a lead. Oh, what I want to know, he, he said the, the score should read 21 to 7. He thinks the Vandals should have scored a, couple, a touchdown somewhere along there. No, I don't think so. I think he's happy to have a one-point lead, a lead of any type. He, he wanted that field goal to go, especially after three timeouts by the Vandals, but hey, we'll go talk about it at halftime and reset for the second half. We played a half and it's living up to its billing. The Super in Idaho, Broncos with a one-point lead. University and from the University of Idaho, Dr. Hoover. Dr. Hoover, you're in hostile territory down here. Well, uh, remember, we're all over the state, so it's not that hostile. We've got about 10,000 alums living here, and so this is, uh, it's so fun. It's what a great afternoon for college football. Tell us what this rivalry means to the Vandals. Well, it's an old one, and, and it's obviously the heart of what we do in terms of football. And I just think it's great uh, in the two and a half years I've been here. Uh, it's just wonderful for the state, and it really closes off the season very nicely. And obviously, we'd like to win, too. Uh, of course you would. Of course yeah. you would. But it's a good game so far. Oh, it's wonderful. Yeah. What do you well, you know whose home this is. This yeah. is Dr. Rook's home. And I understand it's not all hostile and mean-spirited. You two had a diplomatic gathering this morning. Isn't that right? We always get together for breakfast before the game, and then we uh, uh, let the events uh, take place. But this is wonderful. A uh, sold-out house, uh, an all-state event, and we're just tickled to death. Now, you, you've been around the block a time or two, but this, this rivalry and this competition that we have here has to be... Uh, Rated among the, the tops in your book is oh, as no far question as about it. These two schools have been uh, playing football for lots of years, uh, and it ends our season and it celebrates all kinds of, of activities and it's bragging rights for the year. So, that, that's uh, right. Everybody's interested in, uh, in, in a victory. Okay, do you have a prediction for how it's going to end up? Oh, I think we're just going to leave the score just the way it is right now. <laughs> have a wonderful defensive second half. 
Okay, you mentioned bragging rights for the state of Idaho. I want to know if you two guys got a little side bet going on. Oh, no, one of the things we decided, two things we decided to do, we don't bet, and two, we get together before the game, <laughs> not after. So not even a gentleman's bet, huh? Not, not even, even a handshake. No, no, no. When it's Sunday. <laughs> okay, I got a little question. We're here in Bronco Stadium. Dr. Hoover, where are you sitting? I'm sitting right over there, uh, about uh, row H uh, in section 10. Seat one. Okay, and uh, Dr. Up, Rook? Up high with the media. <laughs> it's called the President's Box. He's being just a little humble. We're going to take a quick break. We're going to be back with another competition, Fan of the Game. Don't go away. Here's the part of the show we get to pick the Bronco fan of the game. Your name and where are you from? My name is Pete Erlinson and I'm from Boise. Okay, why should we pick you as the Bronco fan of the game? Well, because I uh, skipped out on studying today to come to this, come to the Idaho game. Oh, I like that. Skip studying. Nice answer. And your name, where are you from? Brad Stokes, Boise Idaho. Okay. Local. Okay, why should you be the Bronco fan of the game? Well, I got out of studying like feet here and I, I don't know, I just, uh, I'm your here face, showing a lot of spirit. Face, face. Lots of spirit. Never face. Show my face. Show my support for the fans. Yeah. Fans. All right. All right. All right. Where, what's your name? Where are you from? Shane Elliott from Boise. Are you a Boise State student? No, I'm from Centennial. Well, are you gonna be a Boise State student? Yes. All right. And why should we pick you as the Bronco fan of the game? Because I got spirit. Yeah. Yeah. So do you have a little cheer? Uh, not really. <laughs> Go Broncos. <laughs> Okay, I gotta ask you first though. Those glasses, they're gold. What's up with that? Well, they got it's just so, you know, the you know, the officials can see the glasses, you know. We got the little blue stars here for the voice of support, you know. Uh, now I understand all three of you guys are friends. Don't you have a little cheer worked up? We just we just compromise. We just, you know, improvise okay. and just, screw just go with the flow and how about how about giving us the mini version? of the wave, since you guys are okay, sitting together. Spread out, let's see. Let's see. One, two, three. Woo! All right, there's our three candidates for uh, Master Rooter Fan of the Game, and whoever we pick will get a nice prize package. Right now, it's kind of Battle of the Bands. The Vandal Band just played, and now it's Boise State's turn, so let's give a listen.
Day tester along with Joe Hughes where the Broncos lead it at the half and Joe this has been so much fun because it's the biggest sporting event in the state of Idaho in the sense of how many fans have watched I know we've talked about it throughout the game but it's amazing that 30 plus thousand have pack in here to see the Broncos and Vandals right and they're not seeing a blowout they're not seeing anything of the sort they're seeing a one-point game at halftime granted maybe not as much of the scoring as they would have liked to have seen but it's a very close game and the, the, we still do not know who's gonna win this baby sure. Dick, Take a look at uh, this is one of the key plays from early on in the first half. Damian Schilling did not have a, an interception all season until this point. Idaho Super Bowl. And then he uh, makes a nice return as well, picking up a couple of blocks from his uh, fellow defenders. And Schilling with the interception and ultimately will set up a touchdown for the Broncos. Aaron Hurley, 46 yards. He's had a marvelous football game. Great block there by Jeremy Mankins. Just opened that up, and Hurley with some breakaway speed. Gets the angle into the end zone, takes it in, and uh, it's been a fabulous season for Hurley. Take a look at the numbers. He came into this football game with 888 yards. We weren't sure if he could go over 1,000, but in this game, he has done just that. How about quarterback John Welsh? Uh, the question all the fans are saying, it's time to pull him as we see him handed off on a big third down play here. But the coaching staff telling me, you know what he's having problems with right now? He wants to throw it deep, and his attitude kind of makes him want to do that. They want him to throw those short patterns. Right. Uh, some of those short patterns have been, uh, well, actually, they've been the only pass patterns that uh, they've been successful on. Take a look at the turnovers. That resulted in points uh, for the Broncos, at least on one of those of those third down conversions. All important. BSU of 50%. Idaho struggling. Numbers say it all. Fairly even football game right now. In fact, just a point separating these two teams as we head into the second half from Bronco Stadium, the biggest game of the year in the state of Idaho. Trees, where the Broncos lead it at the intermission, 7-6, to six, and the main reason, that guy right there. Oh, yeah, Damian Schilling uh, providing uh, the turnover that resulted in the touchdown, and that's the only points on the board for the Broncos, but the only touchdown of the game. Remember, the Broncos deferred the opening kickoff, so they get it here in the second half as Shenard Hartz takes it across to the 15, and that's where a whole host of Vandal tacklers will bring down Shenard Hartz. And I had some folks ask me at halftime, do you think we'll see Nate Sparks in the lineup? Joe, what's your thoughts on that? Well, uh, not with a, a broken thumb or whatever the injured thumb is that he has uh, from that basketball game. I don't. Th I think uh, uh, Nate will be sitting on the sidelines for this game for the senior, unfortunately for him. Yeah, don't know if it's necessarily broken, but an injured thumb. And at this stage, I'll tell you what, Bart Hendricks has done everything that the BSU staff has asked of him. Add two more completions on there for, besides those drop balls. So Aaron Hurley with the football, the Broncos starting right off where they ended with in the first half. With number 24 carrying the football, that's a pretty good game plan. Yeah, and again, they're starting off on the outside. And there's a lot of his success, though. Success, rather, came uh, through uh, through the inside holes. But they're setting it up with the outside. It all plays off of each other. Inside sets up outside. Outside sets up inside. Joe, everybody's saying, where do you go after the game? Well, BSU says we're having our post-game festivities at the Ram after the game. So all the Broncos will be rallying at the Ram, the Vandals. I think they're down at the Grove. So this game continues on throughout tonight into tomorrow. It's early with the football. And Aaron Hurley is close, very close to a first down as he gets ready to tack 10 more yards onto his total, over 1,000 yards rushing this season. Well, Aaron Hurley does very little dilly-dallying when he's running the football. Take a look at the, the hit he puts on number 38, Chris Nofoega, right there at the end. Knocks him backwards onto his back because Hurley can just get the just get the momentum going uh, forward, north and south, like he does so well, and he just, just the inertia just knocking the defenders over. And people saying, you know, Know what that was great to recruit Aaron Hurley to come here to play running back that wasn't why he was recruited <laughs> to come to BSU that's right he came here as a wrestler and uh, and wrestled his freshman year here uh, wasn't I think he had a record of someone like one and seven in his weight class uh, so he made a good choice to go over to the football field and uh, is really seeing his senior season pay off and Aaron might want to thank pop for that because dad went into the coaching office and talked to Tom Mason and some of the guys and said my son should be out on that blue turf. We like him on the mat, but we'd rather have him on the blue turf. And they said, all right, let's give him a shot. And thus Aaron Hurley leading the way for the Broncos here in the beginning of the third quarter. BSU taking on the University of Idaho at home. If the Vandals win, they're into the Humanitarian Bowl. If the Broncos win, their best ever finish as a 1A football team. Option 
to Hurley. Hurley turns the corner. He's got a lot of running room, and he picks up 16 yards on a play that was that close to being brought down for a loss. Right, you know, that play was set up. I remember the, the little pitch uh, that they did to Antoine Wilson in the first half where they handed the ball off while he was in motion. Well, Wilson, they faked the pitch to him. That brings some of the safeties over and then pitch it outside the other direction to Hurley, and that's why it's so wide open along the outside uh, for Aaron Hurley, who knows what to do when he gets to the open field. Bryson Gardner bringing him down. So another first down, and you see if Idaho wins, they go to the Humanitarian Bowl. If Idaho loses and North Texas wins, North Texas is the Big West winner. Antoine Wilson is the winner of that play as Bryson Gardner brings down Wilson, but not before he picks up nearly 20 yards on the pass and catch. Interesting scenario as North Texas is leading New Mexico State University. You watch this again. Joe, do you think North Texas would go into the bowl game, or what would the league try to do? Well, we were talking about this on uh, Channel 6 earlier this week where we're, we're hearing news that if North Texas indeed would be the bowl representative, the league would ask them not to go because of their losing record. So they would bring Nevada in to play in the humanitarian bowl. And thus, Nevada would make its way here. That is just one of the thoughts here. Vandal saying, we just want to win this game. But Aaron Hurley saying, you know what? You can't stop me. Again, Dave, we came into this game talking about uh, the featured running back uh, on the other side of the ball field, Joel Thomas. I get We were talking about Aaron Hurley as well, but he is showing up the Big West Conference by just going head-to-head -head against the league's best running backs and proving that he can have a better game than they can. Aaron Hurley, he's not large by any means, but boy, he is big on the football field. I'd hate to be the one that has to rank the runners. I mean, Denvis Manns, Chris Lemon, Aaron Hurley, Joel Thomas, uh, a guy named Demario Brown. This has been the year of the running back in the Big West. Aaron Hurley with the football across the middle, and you know what? You take a gal to the dance, you stick with her throughout <laughs> the night, and that's what the Broncos are doing with Aaron Hurley, all painted up in blue and orange. Boy, that time I saw Willie Van Gorder just, he was almost 10 yards downfield with his blocker on that side of the line. I mean, the offensive line is just blasting open holes. You've expected this from the Broncos all season with the size that they have up front. This time they're getting it done, and Aaron Hurley is the recipient. So Hurley with 154 yards on the ground. Coming into this game, he's carried the football 200 times. He's the workhorse. Hendrick showing option. He'll keep it himself. One man to beat for a touchdown as he gets it down to the seven-yard line. So they showed option that time, and the young man from Reno, Nevada, picking up the jackpot. Oh, yeah, that time it was great balance by Hendricks. Take a look at his feet here. He almost stumbles right there because of a diving tackler, but he sees the open field ahead of him, and he knows the quickest way to get there is to straight forward a straight line and almost gets into the end zone. Do you think Bart is playing better football because he's known for the last 10 days that he's the man? I think that helped him last year in the same situation. Hendricks again with the option, shows it, keeps it, turns the corner, picks up maybe a couple of yards. Of course, last year, Nate Sparks didn't play quarterback. Right, right. He played wide receiver, and that's what I meant by, by last year. That was a situation where Bart knew that he was the man. Here he is running the ball, but Bart knew that he was going to be the guy through the whole game. And uh, I think that's the situation here, and that gives him, I, th I believe, a little bit more confidence in these games. So the Broncos knocking on the door. Going in the locker room with the one-point lead in which coach said, hey, we should be up 21 to 7. And Joe mentioned that the math doesn't work out on that one some way. But regardless, BSU trying to score. Football's marked to the four-yard line. Option again. Hendricks, touchdown. Here we'll take a look at it. It's against the option play. He's going to read Ryan Skinner, number 44. You see the block put on him, and there's the opening into the end zone. The guy from Reno coming through, getting the second touchdown of either team in the game and giving the Broncos a good lead. So if you're keeping track of his career touchdowns against Idaho, he has three in the air. That his first on the ground. He's got four. Boom, boom, Belcastro with the extra point, and the Broncos leading it 14-6. to 
on what you would think a passing attack of Dirk Cutter, but hey, it was the option attack that did it. Oh, absolutely. Boy, Aaron Hurley had some great runs. Uh, uh, same with Bart Hendricks, and boy, they just marched it right down the field. And you see, they're the only team that's had the ball in the first half. It didn't take that long. Only took less than four minutes to score. But remember, they started clear back on their own 15-yard line. Bart Hendricks finishing it off with style on the option, which really uh, helped out once they crossed the 50-yard line. Well, the Broncos have certainly had some wonderful drives this season, but I got to tell you, nine plays, 84 yards, almost four minutes, that may be vintage. That's one you want to save up. Oh, absolutely, and so much of it was on the ground, and uh, we know the proficiency that uh, the Broncos can uh, throw the ball. We've seen it against New Mexico State. We actually saw it at times against Nevada, and here they are just showing that we're going to march them. We've seen something at halftime that makes them believe they can run all day against the Vandals, and they're showing it so far in the second half. Bell Castro says, you know what? I'm 0 for 3 field goals, but I'm perfect on the extra point, uh, 2 for 2, and when it comes to extra points, there's none better than Todd Bell. Castro 67 consecutive look at that total yards numbers as Bel Castro kind of boots it in I don't know what he call that coffin corner at the 30 yard line regardless the Broncos uh, trying to keep Idaho from having a big return right that was by design uh, from the Broncos uh, coach Cutter has talked about it uh, this season about how they will just try to keep a, a team off balance by this pooch kick I don't know what you want to call it but they kick it high and make sure that uh, there's not going to be a deep run back and once again the freshman Welsh will be the quarterback for the Vandals to start the second half although he hasn't been very productive in the first well luckily playing quarterback has nothing to do with an election because John Welsh even though he's the incumbent, he would be booted out in this one. But the coaching staff at Idaho saying, we're leaving him in. He just needs to throw that short ball. 11-03 in the third quarter. And they hand it off to Thomas. Nowhere to go. And Johnny Reidemann coming up with his second big play of this ball game. John Reidemann along with Bobby Setzer, maybe the two best defensive tackles in the Big West. Well, he came into the game with nine tackles for loss, and look where he is. Reidemann, number 90, in the backfield again. He has made a living there this season. He doesn't always make the tackle, but uh, he disrupts the play by getting back there. Great move right off the line to get penetration into the backfield. Crowd becoming a factor here on second and 12. And you can't put that one on John Welsh, although it will go down on his stats. Lacey should have caught that football. Well, it's tough to get to your quarterback going if you're not going to catch the wide open ball. And Lacey just uh, didn't look that one into his hand. He was thinking about running, I, I guess, before catching. At the conclusion of today's game, Joe and I will single out the most significant play as our play of the game brought to you, as always, by Snake River Yamaha, the Treasure Valley's Yamaha Superstore. So third down and 12, and the Vandals have certainly had their difficult on third down. One of six, and the noise is pouring out of the blue. That time, incomplete. Coach Cutter's right down there saying incomplete pass, and that is the case. Ethan Jones, I thought Jones had enough stick him to bring it down, but not the case. Boy, uh, it was right over on the Broncos sideline, and they were just uh, showing, yeah, you see the ball bouncing around. Obviously, not a catch. And uh, it was far enough down for the first down, but uh, Jeff Davis was there, McKeish Brooks, and uh, nice play by the Bronco defense because they have shut down the Vandalo to start the second half. So Mike O'Neill hoping he wouldn't have to open things up by booting the football, but that is the case for the man who grew up on the beaches of San Diego, California. Ross Ferris nearly getting a glove on that one. Schilling will come up and down it at the 39-yard line, and the Broncos have the momentum here at home and the lead 14-6. to <laughs> Hendricks, who has one touchdown rushing, is 8 of 13, passing 128 yards, brings out the Broncos on first and 10. Idaho going three and out here in the second half. Hendricks wants to go deep for the fastest man on the football field, Corey Nelson. Nelson at the foot race. from Hendricks. Oh, wow about that. Well, he still doesn't have his second touchdown of the season, but he, oh, he came so close. Dave, you talked about the speed uh, early in the, in the first half of Corey Nelson, and this is the play that, uh, that widens out uh, 
the pattern you see because the speed just separates him from the defender he's going to be running the 200 for the broncos on the track team they're hoping that he's going to make it all the way to the to the national finals here at bronco stadium and that one was oh so close to a score 60 yards on the reception the broncos trying to pile it in hendrick's going for his second touchdown no sign from the officials as of yet bsu leading at 14 to 6 now you're wondering Joe is Idaho tired they got in on a bus at 2 30 this morning right in fact uh, they couldn't even get a bus that could take them all the way down to Boise the the buses from the Spokane area so many of them were wrapped up uh, with the Apple Cup game this week or today that they they could only take them as far down as Pendleton Oregon and then some buses from the Treasure Valley went picked them up brought them the rest of the way here at 2 30 in the morning yeah the guys at Caldwell Transit getting him here to Bronco Stadium bright and early Aaron Hurley flies into the end zone he fumbled the football but the question is did he break the plane the officials say no that's a fumble and a big break for the Vandals well it'll be interesting to see did he break the plane with the football or did he indeed fumble it before watch this replay Oh, we'll see. Oh, it looks like, well, it looks like he was on his way up uh, when the, the ball squirts out. It was looked like it uh, tipped off of someone's hand or off, potentially off their helmet. Looked like it, well, he was on his way up, lost the ball. Yeah, I think it was a good call by the officials because yeah. he lost it before he went up and over. Chris Nofiena with the fumble recovery, and the Vandals have it just when we say they're tired, the alarm clock ringing, and the Vandals are back in business. Now listen to the crowd down in that end zone as the Bronco Blue asks for noise on the young freshman, Johnny Welch. Welch will pass it, Ryan Prestamonico, and Prestamonico gets the Vandals out of trouble as he picks up 15 yards and enough for the first down. As you look through the history books, Idaho in some way or another has been tied to weird plane trips in 1979. The Bengals trying to travel to Idaho on the airplane. Their two airplanes didn't get there. The Bengals had to forfeit the game with the Vandals. And then the Vandal basketball team, a year later, their plane from Idaho State coming here to Boise State didn't make it they had to get in the car and they got here just in time to tip it off with the Broncos on the round ball court so they're very familiar with planes that don't work so well Welsh fires it up deep this is going in the neighborhood of no one incomplete pass and that's what the coaches said Welsh can't throw it deep every time right uh, that well that time he made sure that nobody was going to intercept it but he threw it so far that he made sure that nobody was going to catch it either and uh, you were talking about the travel walls even just two years ago when the vandals came here you see what as you look at Welsh's numbers uh, they were late coming a couple years ago they were late uh, getting uh, from just Moscow to Lewiston because of bad road conditions then they had to wait on the tarmac for about an hour they were three or four hours late arriving last year but it didn't affect them because they ended up winning or two years ago because they end up winning 64 to 19. Chris Tormey watching his troops and his young quarterback who's faced with a second down and 10. Welsh throws it pass incomplete and the intended receiver Chris Lacey and Lacey's just unloaded on by Dempsey Dees. Yeah he knocked him into the Bronco coaching staff thought he was going to take down a, he did take down a player or a coach or two over on the sidelines and uh, this, this is actually a fairly high percentage pass play to th uh, just kind of a curl route uh, over on the outside by Lacey, but overthrown, uh, second overthrown by Welsh uh, just in his last two passes. Looked like I thought he was going to get a little bit more confidence with that first pass to Preston Monaco, uh, but now again, David, it's a big third down. Another third down of the Vandals, one of seven on conversions in this football game. They need to get it to the 30. Pump play. Welsh trying to run it up for the first down, and he will get the first down. So the freshman makes a pretty good play there. Brian Johnson chasing him from behind to make the stop. What about Brian Johnson in his career in this game? What He started out as a fullback, and now he ends up as a linebacker. All right. In fact, uh, two years ago, he scored uh, the only touchdown for the Broncos in the first half against the Vandals, uh, catching a pass from Tony Hildy. Welsh actually did a nice job because uh, he was pressed to Monaco's, who he was looking for the whole way, who was covered very nicely by Damian Schilling. But Welsh made something out of nothing by squirting out of the pocket and rushing for the first down. What makes 34? so good well you know he's very strong and fast it's just a great combination for a linebacker Welsh again with the keeper and maybe can't throw the football but he can certainly run with it as he picks up uh, 13 yards the same as his number 
There was a guy that uh, wore 13 for the Vandals that wasn't too bad. Yeah, except he, he threw with the other hand, didn't he? That yeah. was uh, Mr. Nussmeyer spending some time in the pro ranks as well. T take a look at the hits that he takes at the end of this. Boy, Jeff Davis lays one on him. Another couple, wow, a couple of hit, another hits there. Looked like Makish Brooks was in there. And wow, I, Welsh is a tough partner out there. It's averaging about eight yards a run. That was his sixth carry with 45 yards on the ground. Welsh uh, making an adjustment at the line of scrimmage. And Brian Johnson was back there before anyone else, forcing the late handoff. And Ross Ferris growing up just down the road. And I think that's what makes this game so special is the guys from Glens Ferry, the guys from Napa, uh, who watched this game as a kid, and now they get to play in it. Right, yeah, Ross from Glens Ferry on the Bronco side. Someone like Willie Alderson, who's, who's just wa coming out of the game right now, uh, from Napa on the other side for the Vandals. Boy, you saw it was, uh, it was Johnson just, just blitzing right up the middle, disrupting that play. Joel Thomas with a, a nice effort to try and get back, but you see Ross Ferris came in at the end. You know, you might say Corey Nelson's the fastest guy on this team, but Ross says, I'll give him a foot race. Welsh goes deep. He's got a man open, and there may be... Now it looked like he was tripped up. I thought the official reached back for the hanky on that play as Dempsey D's in coverage and Chris Lacey popping up saying, oh, wait a minute, Chris Tormey's clear out in the middle of the field. Well, well let's see if we can see if there was an interference on the play. D's in coverage. Well, it looked like they were running foot for foot, and D's was in good coverage. He was right with them. I think Lacey did have a step on him, and... Um, we couldn't tell from the end of the replay, but I think maybe they was just uh, got their feet tangled up, and it was just incidental contact is what the official rules, and no fly. So it brings up another third down. For the University of Idaho. Welsh may run again. He's had great luck with that. Willie Alderson reaches back and makes the catch. And it looks like Willie has enough for the first down. He kind of fell back on the football, but the official marks it across uh, about a yard past the first down marker, and Willie has a first down. Interestingly enough, when I asked Willie, I go, wasn't it great growing up watching this game? He goes, I think I only went to two Bronco games. <laughs> Maybe that's why he went up to the University of Idaho, uh, where he wanted to play running back, and that's the position he played at Napa High School, but his speed and his moves and his hands, they've converted him to the wide receiver. Last time he played on the blue was the state championship game. He rushed for 230 yards. Brian Prestamonico in motion. The Vandals with another first down, just their third of the game on third down. Joel Thomas, and Thomas trying to emulate what he did two years ago, dives in for the touchdown. almost feel like uh, you're just waiting for Joel Thomas to explode. You can only contain him for so long. And then finally, he gets uh, just a little bit of an opening right there. And you see, he's got this breakaway speed. And just to ensure that he's going to get into the end zone, take a look at the dive. I'm going to get there no matter what and put the Vandals right back on the heels of the Broncos. So Thomas goes 46 yards for the touchdown and gets his team fired up. More importantly, getting the touchdown for the University of Idaho, making it 14 to 12. Of course, with the way the, the formula works, you go for two here to try to tie it up. Option play, Welsh to tie the football, and we've got ourselves a brand new game, 14 all after the Thomas run. Friend is a 15-point swing, and if you remember, the Broncos were getting to go into the touchdown. When Aaron Hurley fumbles it, you take away that seven. Idaho takes it the other way, scores eight points, and the game is tied at 14 all. As Shenard Hartz goes down on one knee. Let's go back to two years ago. Uh, lightning striking twice. Joel Thomas going a little further this time around. Yeah, this one is more in the neighborhood of 90 yards. But again, you see the breakaway speed. And remember, he suffered a few injuries since uh, he ran this one in and, the, and two years ago to the time that he just ran the last one in. But still, Joel Thomas, a dangerous running back with that breakaway speed, gets the Vandals right back in. Yeah, as you said, Joey, went 90 yards on that one. This time around 44 yards to tie the football game up at 14 all. So the Broncos come out with the football. They spotted at the 20. 
Antoine Wilson. Hendricks bobbles the ball, and there's a fumble. I think he got back on top of it. Now the official saying it is uh, Bronco football. Well, not the way the Broncos want to get uh, going after getting this ball game tied up. It sure looked like they were going to go up 21 to 6, and now it's tied at 14. How that plays uh, on the psyche of the Broncos, we will now see. Well, like we said, that 15 point swing, that's got to kind of pull on your noggin a little bit. <laughs> yeah, more than your noggin. Oh, no. Pass, trying to thread it into Antoine Wilson. Bryson Gardner was right there. I was thinking he was the second receiver and we went, let that go. I thought, what are you doing, Bart? Right, yeah, that time he just uh, tried to fire it in there to Wilson, who was well covered by Gardner. Gardner's going to be standing right uh, to the left of your screen, and look at them both uh, had a hand on the ball before it falls incomplete. So Bry Bryson Gardner on the season coming into this game with four interceptions and breaks that one up. It is a third and 12 for the Broncos. Four of seven on third down conversions in this game. Above their average of 33%. Hendricks may run it again, telling Wilsh, anything you can do, I can do better. And the sophomore picking up the first down. Well, the key to that play for Hendricks is if he goes, takes the line out of bounds that he was running in the angle that he had out of bounds without potentially taking a hit, he doesn't get the first down. At the end of this play, he's going to take a look ahead to make sure he gets the first down. If he runs out of bounds here, he doesn't make it. Instead, he does a little fake and then gets an extra couple of yards to make sure that he gets the first down. Good heads up play by Hendricks. Joe, what about that knee brace he's wearing? Well, he injured that knee uh, earlier in the season and uh, it hasn't obviously hasn't hampered him by uh, running the ball today and he's uh, capable of running off 70, 80 yards runs, which we've seen on this very blue turf. So the football has moved up to the 35. Broncos back in business. They show option nowhere to go. So the Vandals leading that one to perfection as Matt Jasic is there to make the stop. Don't forget at the beginning of each game, we bring you the injury report brought to you by St. Al's Life Flight. Call 1-800-574-9464 to join because it's your life. Mautosi in there as well. What's that like, Kevin? I, what was it, Marvin Washington? He was a pretty good uh, football slash basketball player. Uh, he went on to the Jets. I guess they're just very talented athletic, athletically. Yeah, it's amazing that they can transfer between those two sports when so many muscle groups are used differently. They dump it off to Shenard Hart. See his first opportunity to touch the ball on the offensive side. And Shenard changing it up a little bit. Picks up nine yards. Dave, you asked the question about uh, something like, why did Nate Sparks see so much time in, in these games? Well, generally, it came in late at the game because someone like Bart Hendricks is running the ball so much. We've seen him running the ball several times uh, already and taking some big hits. Now you start to wonder if the hits start taking their toll, and uh, you know you would like to see someone like Shenard Hartz or Aaron Hurley carrying the ball, but how, what kind of toll will that take on Hendricks? Generally, he's uh, faltered a little bit towards the ends of the ball game. Third down and one. Hartz is the tailback. Single setback option. Pitched it off somehow, but there's nowhere to go for Shenard Hartz. I thought just for a moment that Shenard would get the first down, and the Vandals hold. So the momentum has certainly shifted and it all started with that fumble by Aaron Hurley on the goal line. Right, because the Vandal defense steps up uh, here. You see Shenard leaving the field, trying the option play to just to get a couple of yards, and the Bart trying to do everything he could to try and get some positive yards from the play, but as it turns out, it just ends up going backwards and more backwards. See how many Vandals are there to stop it. So Gonzo will boot it as they spot it at the 25. Vern Bernard is the deep man. We've already told you about Bernard and his ability, and this one will go out of bounds across to the 34, and that's where the Vandals will have it. This one deadlocked at 14-all in the third quarter. Six on your side, proud to bring you this game. The Broncos and Vandals knotted up at 14-all. Mark Mills told his wife and daughter, I'm going to work, and there's the pictures. This is what kind of work he does is uh, Joel Thomas, the workhorse, gets a yard. Joe, there's a pretty big game going on across the way from us in Pocatello today. Right, uh, we just got a call from Holt Arena where Eagle High School is playing for the A1 Division II state championship game against Blackfoot. The score is Eagle 21, Blackfoot 6 in the third quarter. So Eagle trying to get their first state championship after making it to the title game just a year ago right here at Bronco Stadium. 
played Sandpoint last year right here on the blue. Joel Thomas knocking on the door of the century mark. Of course, that big touchdown run of 44 yards helping out Thomas as well as the Vandals. Who are faced with a second out and four. Play action. Welsh running with the ball. And he may have crossed the line of scrimmage, Joe, when he threw that football. Yeah, he was getting very close. And, boy, I, I really am not certain of uh, the design of that play. It looked like there was some misdirection going on in the backfield. I saw a Bronco back there. And uh, somehow Welsh was able to sneak around. Take a look. It looks like there's some uh, misdirection here right there. Welsh on the rollout. Got very close to the line of scrimmage. And then uh, it was just an incomplete pass. But no call was made. Well, he was talking to the big tight end, Travis Stombaugh. And I don't know whether he wanted Stombaugh to block or keep running his pattern, but regardless, it brings up a third down and four. Bronco defense trying to answer the call. And it is complete to Townsley. And Townsley makes his first reception of this football game and enough for the first down. Well, Welsh is definitely better throwing the short pass. Yeah, and he was looking the way of Townsley the whole way. Townsley was split out uh, in the slot on the left side, and all he does is go down four yards and turn to the outside, and then he just leads him right there to that point. He needed to get across that yard line right in front of him, and he was able to do so and get to the first down for the sophomore, 6'2", 187. Townsley actually was recruited to play quarterback, coming, as we told you earlier, from Miami. They said, you know what, you're going to make a pretty good receiver. We'll have John Welsh do the quarterbacking job as he fires it to Ryan Prestamonico, who sheds Damian Schilling, and Prestamonico just has to get by Dempsey Dees, and look who comes up to make the stop. Yeah, young man from Grangeville, Matt Hall, running all the way. Matt Hill from Grangeville. Prestamonico doing what he has done so well late in the season, making somebody miss. That's how he scored the winning touchdown last week against New Mexico State. He's getting a block downfield by Ethan Jones. He's trying to work uh, his way around, uh, making the defender between him and Ethan Jones. Ends up uh, Matt Hill coming up behind for the tackle. Coach Johnson with the hat on backwards, sending in the defensive play. He gets that from upstairs, relayed. From our location, actually, right next door, the defensive coach is trying to read what's going on. and. Uh, Apparently the defense saying, uh, wait a minute, we need a timeout on the field. And that's what we've got at the 1 minute 16 mark. 14-14, the Vandals on the move. That time, Dave, it was that, that substitution pattern for the Vandals worked against him. I don't think they had enough players out there. Welsh realized it, and the Vandals called the timeout because they worked that substitution pattern. They were actually bringing the play in as well. They were mentioning to Welsh what the play is. He looked out and saw, hey, I don't have enough guys, so they had to force them to call the timeout. We want to thank the folks at Commercial Tire for helping us out this season. At the start of each game, we're proud to bring you the Commercial Tire starting lineups, Commercial Tire, driven to be the best. Well, don't forget the Humanitarian Bowl, December 30th. We don't know who's going to be in there. There's a, a number of scenarios, a chance of Idaho, North Texas, and Nevada against a Conference USA team. But the key, you need to get your tickets now. Call the Boise State Athletic Department at 4 Boise State for more information. Of course, the Vandals knowing that if they win this game, they go to the Humanitarian Bowl. Coach Cutter was very stern this week about saying, that's not our goal, is to keep the Vandals out of the Humanitarian Bowl. We just want to win the football game. But deep down, that keeps them out of the Humanitarian Bowl. Well, yeah, and I think uh, for the for the Broncos, it's sort of, uh, that's not their main goal, but it is the icing on the cake, knowing that they kept their arch rivals from going uh, to a bowl game. They want the win. They want to finish the win finished the year with a 7-4 and four record and know that, the, that they had a, an excellent output in their first season at, as the coaching staff. And Joe, I'm just told that North Texas has defeated New Mexico State, so thus if the Vandals lose this game, North Texas is the Big West champion. Whether or not they would come to the bowl, we'll have to wait and see on that. Ryan Prestamonico makes the catch. Coming up to make the stop is Ty Dayton. Uh, you see a minute and seven seconds in here. Vandals aren't really worried about North Texas or Nevada because they know if they win this game, they're going to the Humanitarian Bowl. But if they lose, then all of a sudden a bunch of crazy things start happening. Right. The Bronc or the Vandals having the luxury of knowing that they're the only team in the Big West that still controls their own destiny. And by winning this game today, they can ensure themselves a berth in the Humanitarian Bowl. That's a lot to play for, even if you had rolled into town at 2.30 this morning. Second down and eight. Football is spotted at the 17. Vandals trying to take the lead in this one. 
Welsh on a little misdirection has nowhere to go as Mike Malloy comes up and the Broncos are saying he fumbled the football and the officials are not signaling anything as they get right in the middle of that pile. This is where it's rugby time. Yeah. Scrum I, time. <laughs> you know, Ross, hey, they're, they're giving, they're giving, giving the it to the Broncos. And the guy who caused that was Ross Ferris, number 27 in the backfield. The kid out of Glens Ferry, Idaho, was causing all kinds of havoc back there, Dave. He was, first he was instrumental in enforcing a Welsh out of the pocket, and then he laid the hit on Welsh that jarred the ball free. Number 27 will come into your frame. Uh, first, on the, first he was right there, almost got the tackle, and then he'll come in from the backside, boom, there. Number 27, knocking the ball free, and that's, uh, there he is, Ross Ferris hitting the, the ball with his helmet practically, jarring it loose and giving the ball back to his Broncos. So that is the ter third turnover of the game for the Vandals. Now trading fumbles is the Broncos were knocking on the door earlier in this quarter, fumbling it. Vandals in the same scenario, fumble the football, and the Broncos come up with it. 27 clicks on the clock. Two of those Vandal turnovers, interception. But it seems like John Welsh has settled down a little bit. No, he fumbles the ball. Antoine Wilson to the top of your screen. Aaron Hurley busts up the middle. Get a little feisty down there on the football field. Do you notice that? Well, <laughs> it's uh, the nature of this rivalry. These two teams, they won't talk about it during the week before because they're coached not to talk about the rivalry because they don't want to give any fodder for the other team to post up on the locker room chalkboard or whatever. But, uh, you know, they don't like each other very much. We'd like to say the final 15 minutes coming up, but a year ago they went to overtime. Will we see it again? Fourth quarter when we come back to the blue. Cheer about Joe, the largest crowd ever to see a sporting event in the state of Idaho. More than 30,000, 30,208 here uh, watching Idaho's Civil War number 28. Aaron Hurley with the ball and he's got a lot of running room. Amazing day. A little misdirection. The fake to Antoine again. And boy, once he gets past the line of scrimmage, Aaron Hurley sees the angle, puts the move on Bryson Gardner, and take a look at him go the rest of the 75 yards. I got to tell you, I didn't think he was going to make it in because uh, I didn't think he had the breakaway speed, but Hurley has a nose for the end zone, and he's going to get there because he wants to. The extra point attempt on its way. 21 to 14. We have a running back battle going on. Aaron Hurley versus Joel Thomas, the 75-yard run. And you look down in the record book, and we see we've got him very close to the, the big numbers. Of course, uh, the Broncos loving this, what is happening here. Casey Adams having the longest, a big one against Northern Arizona, 80-plus yards. What do we got him? Number five down right behind Bart Hendricks. Right, uh, just yeah, just ahead of Bart Hendricks. Bart's was 73 yards here against Louisiana Tech. This one comes in at 75 yards for Aaron Hurley. He didn't think that, I didn't think he had the speed to get there, but uh, he just uh, is able to break the tackle and then dive into the end zone. What a play by Aaron Hurley, which is just exemplary. Uh, it's just an example of the way this guy has played all season long, all kinds of heart and wanting to get into the end zone more than people want to stop him. 235 yards rushing, Coach Cutter saying Aaron Hurley, uh, undeniably the heart and soul of this team when it came time to elect the captains. He was the unanimous selection along with Jim Brecky and Bobby Setzer. Boy, Dave, he, he was shattering that 1,000-yard season he was looking for. Heck, he got that in the first half, and now he's just pushing it beyond and beyond. So a little excitement for you in this one as Belcastro boots the football. Jerome Thomas will take it at the two-yard line. Thomas with running room along the side gets it up to the 21, and that's where the Vandals will operate first and 10. 
day. We're told that Aaron Hurley already has 235 yards rushing in the game, which is the second most rushing yards ever in one game for the Broncos. Max Corbett, the SID in our booth here. Uh, that's great when you bring the SID <laughs> right into your booth. What's he got to beat, Max? Who's number one? Cedric Mentor, who's uh, well, hopefully he's watching in Nissa today. 261 yards. So, Cedric, uh, your number is... Uh, close to being eclipsed. I don't think he would mind if it was in this game. That's a 20-year-old mark for Cedric at uh, 78 was when that one was run. So the Vandals trying to come back the other way. Welsh fires it up. Pass is complete to Preston Monaco. Well, I think he actually lost a yard. By the time he actually caught that, he was three or four yards uh, downfield. By the time he catches it and Damien, Damien Schilling jumps on his back, uh, looks like it's only good for about a yard gain. Well, if you went away for a minute during the intermission between third quarter and fourth quarter, you say, well, what happened? Well, Aaron Hurley on a little misdirection running at 75 yards two weeks ago. He ended up with three touchdowns. Here he's over 200 yards, maybe making up for the fumble he had. Right, y'all. Yeah, well, you know that uh, he felt more horrible about that than anybody. Else. Thomas is going to throw it back to quarterback John Welsh, and Welsh is wide open along the sidelines. This is right out of the Bronco playbook as Welsh finally gets brought down across the 37-yard line, and Thomas on the season perfect when it comes to throwing the football 4-4-4. Four, four, four. Right, we've seen this. We saw this last week against New Mexico State, and as you said, Dave, this is the fourth time that Joel Thomas has attempted a pass and the fourth time that he has completed it. Take a look at the move that John Welsh makes uh, once he gets uh, downfield. He's going to do a little cutback, and because of the slick turf, see uh, Ty Dayton there? He just goes slip, and this is able to get another 5, 10 yards out of the play. Nice running by Welsh as well. As well. Boy, we're seeing some fireworks now, Dave. Linebacker Derek Burrell is down on the blue. Uh, they're checking out his injury. We'll watch it one more time. You attack when you see Joel with the ball. Sure you do. You know he's, he's very dangerous running the ball. And in that throwback, you don't generally guard a, a quarterback when he bleeds off of the play like that. Uh, so he just goes out to the sideline. Nobody is around. Fortunately for the Broncos, they are able to catch up to him and make the tackle, but not until he's got a big game for the Vandals. To my knowledge, that is the first time Joel Thomas has thrown it back to a quarterback all season long he's thrown it down deep to the receiver we've seen that though from the Broncos three times this year Welsh pump fakes now he hangs it up to Willie Alderson Alderson goes up and scores <laughs> 37 yards to Willie Alderson who grew up just a 20 minute drive down the road gets his first touchdown in this Super Bowl game. Boy, he was so intent on catching this this ball. We'll see it here. Uh, Welsh, looks like it was an audible. He saw something that he liked, does the pump fake, and then Alderson. Look at him go up with both ends. I'm going to make sure and get this. Wow, he almost bobbled it on his shoulder pad a little bit. And wow, man, this baby is could be tied up right here. Extra point on the way. And Joe, you asked for it. You've got it. 21 all 13 minutes 22 seconds to go we told you johnny welsh likes to talk well that time he said willie alderson who's tied it up the football coach dirk cutter when i asked him do you remember any games like this playing when he was the quarterback at idaho state said nothing really jumped out i have a feeling he remembers his matchups with the vandals but uh, he said, I don't want to hike this week. He said, you take care of that, Dave. We'll wait until Saturday. And I think he's done a pretty good job of that. Yeah, well, he couldn't ask for a better ball game, Dave. Tied at 21 all in the fourth quarter. This one could be destined for overtime, just like last year. Wind blowing just a little bit as Ben Davis tries to boot this one off. I want to mention hi to Jim Powell, who's a huge Bronco fan. Just Happens to be uh, watching the game from the hospital. Hope everything's going better. And hello to Jim Powell. Jim, get well soon, as is the case for Pam Martinez. Gene Blameyers telling you, get back up here where you belong. We want to thank uh, the folks at NAS Singers. Dave Lancaster, who's watching in his shop. Uh, we want to thank him for helping us throughout the season with a, a fabulous wardrobe. This is going to be hard for Dave because he's a big Napa High School fan, but he's also a big Bronco fan, and to watch Willie Alderson go in there. Right. I think he, he's very uh, happy to see Willie Alderson uh, succeeding, but he sure hates to see that happen against his Broncos. The Eagle High School has just won the A1 Division II Championship, so congratulations to the Eagle Gang. As we imagine they're running to a TV right now to watch the rest of this one. 
13 minutes, 17 seconds in regulation. We're not at a 21 all. Hendricks play action. He's got a man, Dave Stekhelski. And uh, Stack was just that as he couldn't find the handle. Stahelski was actually blocking first off on the play, and it was uh, well designed. Everything happened except for the catch. Take a look at the good play action by Bart Hendricks. Rolls around to the right. Stahelski was blocking and just, well, he's looking at his hands going, why do you fail me now right in the fourth quarter of Idaho Super Bowl? Stahelski with just two receptions. They say he's the most fit, the most amazing athlete on this football team. But uh, he's just struggled with injuries. He's played defensive end. He's played tight end and has not been the marquee guy they had expected. So it makes a second and 10 again. Uh, Hendricks play action under pressure. He's got room to run if he wants to just tuck the football. And that's what he'll do as he cuts across to the 30 and up to the 42. So Hendricks, and the thing he's got to be careful of is if he gets hurt, we told you about Nate Sparks with the bad thumb. Coach says, I don't know if Nate could play. It would probably be Brian Harson. Right, and Brian Harson, uh, I think he's only thrown nine passes uh, for the entire season, completing one of those. Nice block downfield right there by Aaron Hurley to try and ensure that Hendricks was going to get the first down. He ended up getting much more, a good 10 or 15 more yards. Hendricks is, uh, is showing that he is just a, a very uh, capable running threat. The 300-pound freshman will back from his nose guard position making the stop. Ryan Skinner says he's the best defensive player out there. Wilson now is going to return the favor as he throws it to Jeff Putzier. And Putzier can't make the handle, and it's intercepted. So the Vandals come up with the interception. I thought Putzier was going to be able to, to bring that down, but Ige Evero with the interception in the right place at the right time. We have a flag down on the play, so we'll hold everything for a moment. And it's going to be roughing the passer. And it looks like that'll come back. Speaking of roughing the passer, who would have thought Antoine Wilson was going to get called for roughing the passer as he plays the role of quarterback? Right. You saw uh, someone in a white jersey coming in to, to lay the hit on uh, on w as he was throwing the football. I think uh, actually throwing it down the field was his second option. I saw Bart. He was kind of caught up in the middle trying to get out to, along the sidelines, and that's who Wilson is generally thrown to on that particular play. But... Uh, Bart got caught up in, a, in it. On the defense, roughing the passer, 15 yard penalty from the previous spot, automatic first down. Wow, take, that takes away a turnover. That's just a huge play against the Vandals. Now, Bart was trying to go out uh, and receive a pass, but uh, Antoine Wilson, he was not open, so he goes downfield. Look I'll at the bottom of your screen, Joe. Let's see if we can see who did that. Well, here comes uh, number eight. Now, keep a look at the left side of your screen. Jersey and White's going to come in and lay the hit out right there. Well, he's, he, he was moving too fast, a little bit blurry, but that's where the hit came from. So Aaron Hurley gets the football, and Aaron picks up about eight yards on that, so a big break for the Broncos. And one of the questions is, can you still be the passer on a pitch? Will you still play the role as quarterback? Right, he's still behind the line of scrimmage. It's just as if uh, Bart Hendricks had rolled out there himself and threw the ball. You can't uh, just lay a hit on him that hard uh, a second or two after he's thrown the ball. Now, they're saying big Will Beck is the man with the late hit, and you know he can't comes in. He's a true freshman, and I think he just said, "Hey, I was going in there as hard as I can." So our producer crew back of the truck saying number 91 was the guy with the late hit. Aaron Hurley trying to get the first down and more. Aaron zeroing in on that mark of Cedric Mentor. Right, yeah. Aaron just hits the hole so hard and so quick. He doesn't wait for holes to really open up. It's like, I am just going to hit whatever hole I see first. Uh, so maybe not quite the same kind of vision you see from someone else, like even Joel Thomas or, or Shenard Hartz. But his strength is just hitting that hole hard, going straight forward, and it works for Aaron Hurd. Cutter hearing uh, the offensive coaches up in the headset relaying the play to Brian Harson. You see the shoulder of Brian Harson there, number 16, who is actually the backup quarterback in this game. And we will take a timeout. You saw Coach K say, Hey, take the timeout, let's get the play right. 21 21. It's a wild one on the blue. That's why kids growing up think Bronco Vandal football is not so bad. 
Sparks come in in a pinch? Probably not. Coach Cutter said he has not practiced all week long. In fact, for 10 days, he injured his thumb in a basketball class. And he's not available. But Antoine Wilson says, whoa, we don't need you. Brian Gardner, or Bryson Gardner, rather, looked like he hit uh, Antoine a little bit late, but that's part of the game. Is Antoine okay? I believe so. I think he <laughs> took out one of our audio technicians as well down there. Let's see if we can hear. Let's let's hear our audio technician. Captain Audio, take it away. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Nicely done, gang. Oh, boy. Who, who do we got on audio down there? Is he okay? You see it all, you hear it all. Andy, are you okay? Andy, give me a thumbs up if you're okay. Yeah, I think he's okay. Oh, boy. He bounced up quick. All right. Now, that's part of it. If you're going to work on the crew, you've got to be ready for a Super Bowl-type atmosphere. As Aaron Hurley trying to pick up the three for the first down is stymied. I remember a game earlier this season, Dave, where the Broncos were awfully excited to have two 100-yard rushers in the same game, Shannar Hartz and Aaron Hurley. Now they have uh, uh, two 100-yard rushers wrapped up into one player in Aaron Hurley, well over 200 yards. Well, and prior to this game against Weber State would have been Aaron Hurley's big game, uh, nearing 200 yards, but he's eclipsed that one. Third down and two for the Broncos, and you wonder, is this four-down territory? Corey Nelson got in the way, but Hurley, no, he's gonna, I thought Hurley may have had enough for the first down. What happened there, Joe, with Corey Nelson going in motion, getting in the way of Bart Hendricks? You know, that whole play that they've been running is a whole timing type of pattern. He want, they want to fake to Corey Nelson, but Corey is just a little too close inside. Actually, his elbow hit the face mask of Bart. It was a good thing that Bart was even able to hand the ball off there because that'll throw your whole play off. Well, it appears like, and we say appears like, the Broncos are going for it. Would you try to make Idaho jump? Would you dive it? Would you run the option? Fourth down and inches. Sit back and enjoy this one at home. So the Vandal defense comes up and stops Arrowhead Hurley. Big play for the Vandals. Of course, there's a number of plays you can run, but still thinking with that flex defense, you might go option. Right, and in fact, in that play, Aaron Hurley does what he hasn't done all season. He stops when he gets to the line of scrimmage. I mean, Aaron's strength is just driving his legs forward where, wherever the hole might even be. Even if there isn't a hole, he will push the, the, the pile forward if need be. That time he hesitated, and it cost the, the Vandal or the Broncos the, vault, the ball going over to the Vandals. Rick GMP tree with the play. Gets to take his hat off, and I guess, Joe, now the question is that we ask you, was it wise to go for it? Bel Castro 0 for 3. Well, in a tie game, well, it's hard to se second guess now, but uh, I think you, you would have should have gone for it there. Thomas picking up a couple before Brian Johnson brings him down. Well, I think you got to say, hey, this is the big game of the year. And the Broncos literally have nothing to lose in this game. Why not go for it on fourth down? Well, and who's going to stop your 240-plus yard uh, rusher in this game? I mean, the Bro uh, Broncos have been running the ball so effectively. Why not think they can get a yard, even when the Vandals are expecting them to try to rush for that yard? Joel Thomas with 101 yards. Coming up at the end of the game, Joe and I will announce the Work Care Northwest Player of the Game. Work Care Northwest, today's solution for workers' compensation risks. Second down and eight. They give it to Willie Alderson. No. Well, she's going to keep it under pressure. He's throwing it deep. He's got a man open, and that is Ethan Jones. And Jones has one man to beat. He's off to the races. Touchdown. 75 yards. Ethan Jones puts the Vandals on top. So many things worked well for the Vandals on this play. First, it's the play action worked well for the fake reverse to Willie Alderson. We even thought Alderson had the ball. Then the deep throw downfield. Dempsey Dees is going to get tied up a little bit. He's in coverage. He falls over. And then look at this. A couple of Broncos knock each other out of the play. McKeish Brooks tripping, and that results in uh, the touchdown for the Vandals to take the lead. So the extra point goes through, and now the Vandals lead it by a touchdown. You couldn't ask for anything better than this. The Broncos and the Vandals back and forth, back and forth. Right now, Idaho's up by seven.
football. He runs 75 yards to tie this one up. And then they toss it to Ethan Jones, who goes 75 yards for the touchdown. Two plays. And now the University of Idaho leads it 28-21. And I think that's big Nate Colbert, who, where did he grow up? Moscow, Moscow Idaho? Idaho? Oh, man. Nate's thinking, I got to touch the ball in this game. Boy, this is just going back and forth and back and forth. We were talking about uh, how uh, poorly John Welsh was playing in the first <laughs> half. All of a sudden, he's got a couple of touchdown passes to his credit and a lead. So Bart Hendricks will come out behind the big body of Jermaine Bellin and send BSU the other way. They have the football at the 31. Plenty of time of this football game. Eight minutes, 49 seconds remaining in re regulation. We say that because last year this one went into overtime. Hendricks across the middle to Antoine Wilson. You know, we've talked a lot about Antoine Wilson. Is there another guy, receiver on this team that the Broncos like to throw it to? Right, a guy who also wears a single digit, number five, Rodney Smith, who has been awfully quiet in this game. And a lot of that uh, could be just a result of the way the Vandals are playing defense against him. And I think the Broncos knew that Antoine was going to be open uh, several times in this game, and they've been looking his way quite often. Rodney has one reception in this game for four yards. He had four touchdowns two weeks ago, just four yards in this ballgame. Hendricks on second and four, dumps it across the middle. The man from Weezer, Ron Pounder, scampering along the sidelines. Pound cuts across the middle. And Pound goes to the five-yard line. I bet they're going wild in Weezer right now. Wow, watch that Wolverine run. That was amazing. The cutback especially. Ron Pounder doesn't see the ball a lot of times. Uh, able to make the grab, and wow, he was so wide open. He just drug him right across the back uh, of the defensive line, and nobody picked him up. He was wide open, and then the cutback. Keep it going. His ninth reception, or he had nine receptions coming into the game, 145 yards, and uh, boy, he added a nice chunk on top of that on that play. Let's see. Weezer's famous for a country singer, a golfer, and now Ron Pound, who puts the football on the six-yard line. Hurley bouncing up, trying to get his second touchdown of this ball game. Well, you know what? The senior is going to save that tape for better years to come. And, you know, Ron Pound has taken some heat for not catching a lot of footballs, but Coach Cutter says, hey, he's doing the job, and that's not what Ron Pound's expected to do. You don't go, let's hit the go-to guy, Ron Pound. Right, exactly. I mean, he does his job, and he does it well, and he's actually been very sure-handed throughout the season. Didn't start off so so well, but as the season has wore on, Ron Pound is a guy who you know is going to bring the ball in, and who knew he had that kind of yardage in him as well. Second down and goal on the option. Hendricks turning the corner, and he gets it up to the one, and it brings up a third down at the seven-minute mark. Well, if the Broncos don't get on this in on this play, then you really start wondering if they would go for it again on fourth down because then the clock really does come into play with a little bit more than six and a half minutes to go in the game. The clock would certainly work against them if they don't get into the end zone here. Joe, it's interesting how the south end zone is that of Boise State. I think this north end zone has a lot of Vandal fans yelling right down there. <laughs> sure do. Joe's pass, touchdown, Jim Brecky, his first of the season, the senior from right here in Boise, looking to tie this football game up. It's an extra point away from doing so. Wow, the former Capitol Eagle has been silent in the end zone the entire season, like you said, Dave. And uh, they call on big number 88 to make the catch in the corner of the end zone. Sure-handed, brings it right into his chest for the for the catch. And an uh, extra point away from another tie. So Bel Castro for the point after, the kick on the way. Everything we expected and maybe a little bit more. 28 all in front of 30,000 plus fans. 
Well, Joe, if you look back on this play, what set it up? Was it that pass to number 44? Oh, absolutely. And Pound was just worked his way right across the opposite side of the field that everyone else, were, everyone's rolling out. Everything is geared to go off to the right. Ron Pound just kind of leaks over to the left and then springs in the ball. And then he just has so much wide open field. And then that cutback. Nice play running, or nice running of the ball after the catch by Pound to open that up. And then the good throw and catch, Hendricks to the Capitol Eagle, playing in his final game in Boise. Coming in with the tying touchdown. Call it the tight end drive as Pound catches it. Brecky catches the touchdown. Pound, as we told you, was an offensive tackle in high school. They were giving him hard time. Pound can't catch the football unless he's a linebacker. He also played that, but with the bandana on, he makes the play and sending the Bronco cheerleaders to the push-up line. 28 of them right now. Kickoff goes into the end zone, and boom, boom, feeling it as well. So the Vandals will come out first and 10 at the 20 at the 619 mark. Joe, is it the last person with the football winning this game? Well, I look at the clock with 619, Dave. I think there's a, uh, enough time for at least two more touchdowns in this game, and then send it into overtime. Yeah, this uh, this has really turned into an offensive show. Remember, this game was 7-6 to six at halftime, and we were really uh, looking at how well the defenses were playing. But, uh, boy, the Vandals and Broncos have put their scoring shoes on in the second half. And you see the numbers on John Welsh. Two interceptions in the first half, two touchdowns in the second half. A story of two halves as we're not at a 28-all. Vandals with the football. Joel Thomas gets it, trying to turn the corner, does that and more as he pushes it up to just about the 30-yard line. They'll mark him at the 31 for a pickup of 10 yards as Thomas has rushed for 111 yards in this game. If you love Bronco football, don't miss Bronco Sports Week with head coach Dirk Cutter. Join the Channel 6 sports team at 1020 Sunday night on Channel 6. It's the official coaches show of BSU Athletics. So after the pickup of 11, it's first down for the Vandals, moving it up to the 31. Thomas, the single setback, two receivers, that's Roberg and motion. Thomas following his blockers, maybe picks up a yard, gets behind big Rick DeMoling. How does an offensive tackle play quarterback in high school? But that's the case of Rick DeMoling, number 69. Boy, I sure would like to see some tape of that. <laughs> I mean, he's obviously a big player, but uh, to see him actually back in the pocket, you know, shedding a tackle or two, throwing downfield, but uh, he has made the nice uh, conversion. You see Joel Thomas's number, also well over 100 yards, uh, but he's been a little bit <laughs> eclipsed by number 24 in blue. So Thomas picking up two yards, makes it second and eight. We're at the five and a half minute mark of this football game blitz on the way by Davis they just do get it off to Thomas who will be about two yards shy Jeff Thomas was about a second shy of picking up the sack Joel Thomas is just uh, dangerous whenever he gets the ball whether it's uh, late in the play or just uh, on a pitch sweep or something like that uh, Sometimes you just uh, you just overlook the fact, uh, the amazement that this guy is only 5'6". Sometimes he can be hard to see back there. He, look, at he's hard to see in the back of the huddle. Is he tired? Well, he's he, breathing hard. He now. is, yeah. It's, uh, it's been a hard-fought game, and maybe that's why they're getting a timeout here. Vandal coach Chris Tormey talking to his troops. On the other side, Coach Cutter discussing the scenario on this third down and two. Don't forget the best basketball in Idaho is on Channel 6 in December. We invite you to look at our lineup that starts with the Broncos and Indiana. That game is on December 11th. A 4 o'clock tip-off for that. Washington State will take on Idaho and then Boise State and Idaho State all on Channel 6. Six is on your side when it comes to the best basketball around. And that's all the prelude before we uh, start following the Broncos in their Big West season, especially on the road. Both sides discussing. There's Coach Mills in the middle of that pile, the defensive coordinator. Coach Johnson on the other side, who's hooked up to Coach Guy. We look in. Uh, looks pretty quiet down there in the coach's box, just to the left of us from our broadcast location. A game like this, you know, you really can't say much than just, you know, guys, look at the scoreboard and go out there and 
do your job. Third and two, this is a pretty big play. It doesn't seem like a big one, but it's adding up. Well, with uh, just five minutes to go in the game, yeah, the, uh, every play from here on out is going to be a big play, especially while the game is still tied. And I think you made a good observation, Dave, that Joel Thomas was really breathing hard there, and I think uh, Coach Tormey and the rest of the coaching staff realized that, that maybe the whole offense was needing a, a quick little breather before they try this big third down play. The Vandals are 4 of 10 on third down conversions in this game, but in the second half, they are 3 of 4. Maybe no bigger play than this one right here, third down and 2. Brian Johnson meets Joel Thomas head on, and that means the Broncos are going to get the football back. Brian Johnson, who caught a touchdown in this game as a fullback a year ago, says, I like to, yeah. He looks like a linebacker. He's got pad hanging out there and the jersey, the whole works. Oh, yeah. Take a, he's going to be number 34, just shifting along the line there. And then, wow, look at the way he meets Joel Thomas. Sandoval comes in to, to pile on as well as John Reidman to make sure that uh, there's no first down for the Vandals there. Brian Johnson, the defensive leader for the Broncos. He played high school ball for Dirk Cutter's brother, Brent Cutter, who last night won the state championship in A1 football. The boot on the way by Mike O'Neill, Damian Schilling, We'll take it at the 26, and the Bronco offense will head back out onto the football field, tied at 28 all with 4 minutes, 14 seconds to go. Well, now, if the Broncos are able to get another drive going, especially with Aaron Hurley leading the way, they could run out the clock uh, on this game and score either a winning touchdown or field goal. The question may be, if they get it down there, look at Brian Johnson. He's, he's still pumped up about that. Came into the game with 69 tackles, which led the team, and uh, he's added certainly a few more onto that, as well as that big uh, tackle for loss on the last play. You can't just tell linebacker, good job. you got to come up and give him a headbutt or a chest butt. Make sure you got gear on though before you do that football is at the 26 Hurley carries it as he nears in on the record for a single game Dave we were talking that we've really been focusing in on the on the running game and we certainly haven't seen very much of a, like you said Dave number five Rodney Smith well I noticed on the last play that Rodney's in single coverage and you see someone like Aaron Hurley leaving the, the ball game maybe they might be throwing the ball here and maybe start looking the way of Rodney Smith in clutch time Mike uh, the sports king sharp our statistician telling us just eight yards shy of the record is Aaron Hurley play action for Hendricks Hendricks keeping the football, trying to turn the corner, and he'll be about four yards shy of the first down. Shenard Hartz was open just for an instant, but that is where Bart has improved this season, is not trying to force it. Right. He could have, in fact, we were just talking about Rodney Smith as well, who uh, was in a seam in between two Vandal defenders, but if he throws the ball, you look at Skinner all the way downfield. I mean, he's the linebacker. Look at how they're falling back in pass coverage. So a good uh, idea by Bart to not force something and get good yardage and making it close, at least on third down. Broncos need to pick up two yards to keep the drive alive. Football is spotted at the 34. They need to get it to the 36. Fumbled. Who comes up with it? I think Aaron Hurley came up with the football. The Broncos did not get the first down, but they did get the football back. Yeah, and that was that would have been a disaster if uh, the Broncos turned the ball over right there. Take a look at the exchange from center. That's where the problem occurred. It looked like uh, Bart was looking to turn around and fake the handoff or, or maybe hand the ball off to Corey Nelson right out of the gate. Result is a fumble, but the Broncos are able to, at, at the very least, punt the ball instead of giving the Vandals the ball on their own 30-yard line. So John Gonzalez comes out. We have a timeout on the football field. Boise State with two timeouts remaining. The Vandals with just one. This one charged to the University of Idaho. Well, Joe, there's a question if the Vandals were not to win this football game, North Texas winning already, does North Texas come to the bowl game? Well, according to the formula, yes, that is the case because it'll be a four-way tie for first place featuring the Broncos, and without going into the tiebreaker and whatnot, North Texas is next in line. The word is, yeah, they would be Big West champions, but more than likely would be persuaded to turn down the bid. Thus, Nevada would come in here and play 
The only question is, would they play Southern Miss, a team that they're playing today? Right. In fact, a, a team they're trailing. Uh, Nevada's trailing Southern Miss 48 to 14 in the fourth quarter. And uh, that is a home game for Nevada. So that could be a rematch. Dave, uh, I don't know how uh, excited the Big West would be to have a 3 and 8 team representing them uh, in the Humanitarian Bowl, which would be North Texas record. That's the other side of the scenario. If the Vandals win, they go to the Bowl. And believe me, John L. Smith, a number of people from Conference USA saying don't rule out Louisville John L Smith's return back to the blue for the humanitarian bowl the second year in a row as Gonzo boots the football Bryson Gardner taking it at the 30 Mike Davison had a shot there is a flag in there as Gardner gets it up to the 40 yard line well, that flag is in the vicinity of an illegal block, and uh, this could be coming back uh, for the Vandals, which they, they, if that doesn't happen, they have good field position with the 40-yard line. And remember, they only need a field goal to take the lead in this game. They don't have to go touchdown uh, to win this ball game. In fact, it, wow, actually it looks like it, they're signaling against the Broncos. What happened was Mike Davison did not give Bryson Gardner enough room to catch the football. And you could see him on that return just kind of drop back for an instant. Jack Wood says the Vandals will decline that penalty, but we've seen two of those. Joe, something to keep in mind. We had an overtime as we see Mike Davison trying to back up at the last moment. No overtime ever in Bronco Stadium. Uh, since the rule came into effect. Remember, they've just had the rule where you play off the overtime some 13 years. Well, I'm up for overtime, are you? Oh, you betcha. Welsh going deep. Ryan Presto Monaco, and I was afraid for a moment Presto was going to run under it. And then you see Dempsey Dees, if he can get a glove on it, as we saw two weeks ago when he made the one-handed interception against New Mexico State, he'll pick it off. Sure, yeah. In fact, he tipped it to himself. It looks like he, yeah, it looks like he actually did get a piece of it there. That time he wasn't able to get enough of a piece of it to deflect it back to himself. But more importantly on that play, he deflects it so that uh, uh, the Vandals are unable to complete the pass and continue on, which looked like that one would have gone on for a touchdown had it been complete. Numbers on Welsh in this game, 11 of 31. 272 yards, a couple of touchdowns, two interceptions, and a fumble. Welsh throws this one complete to Willie Alderson. Alderson, at the beginning of the season and throughout his career at Idaho, has played the running back slot. Coach Tormey said, I've got to figure out a way to get him the ball more. Now he plays the slot position. He still goes to running back meetings, but his position right now is receiver. Right, and here, now Vandals are going no huddle. No huddle, Vandals back to live action, throwing the ball, and caught by Willie Alderson. So we'll keep our eye on the no huddle, and the reason they're going no huddle is because there's a minute and a half remaining in this ball game. So they're trying to get it down into field goal range. As you see the Thompson's Maytag clock. Remember, the defense for the Broncos is relayed all the way from the top of the press box down to Coach Johnson, the defensive line coach, and fired onto the football field. Welsh back to pass. He's hit from behind. And there's a fumble football, and the Broncos have it. The question was, is it an incomplete pass? No, they say it is Bronco football. So Ty Dayton from Reno playing in his last game, 33, comes up big. What an amazing turn of events there. It looked like, indeed, it was a fumble. It didn't look like his arm had gone forward yet. The ball on the, on the blue turf, and McKeish Brooks heads up. Good vision comes over and falls on it, and another turnover for the Vandals. If the Vandals end up losing this game, they can look at that stat right there. Turnovers have killed them, although they have certainly played much better in the second half. McKeish Brooks coming up, making a big play. McKeish, McKeish is one of just three corners for this team. They've hit it all season long with only three cornerbacks. But they've done a very good job, and now the Broncos fumble the football and give it back to the Vandals. Well, all game long, Joe, Boise State has struggled with that little play where the man goes in option, and they try to hand it off. I believe it is because it is such a timing play, they need to hit the, the snap just so to fake this handoff or even hand the ball off uh, to the 
to the man in motion. That time it looked like the ball just got hung up on the offensive line. It never hardly even made it into the hands of Bart Hendricks as he pulls out right there. There's the ball on the ground. Vandals recover. So the Vandals get the football back and uh, just kind of trading things off. There's Will Beck, big 91, who was called for that late hit. Hard to believe, as we see an injured player down on the football field, hard to believe that uh, in this day and age, a freshman could just walk onto the team out and step up and play some football. Right, yeah, and not even to take a too long. Oh, is that Keith Dilworth? Keith Dilworth being helped off, playing his prep ball just down the road at Bora High School. Paul Peterson, his coach. Paul Peterson, another Bengal quarterback. We bring that up because Dirk Cutter played quarterback for the Bengals. Well, certainly not a good sign for the Broncos if they indeed get the ball back. There is only a minute 25 left in the game, and with the Vandals having the ball in the 40-yard line, they don't need to go too much further to get into field goal range. BSU has fumbled the football five times in this game. They have lost it twice. A minute 25 to go, deadlocked at 28 all. Jeff Davis with the sack that time, and a good play by Welsh. And you say, why was it a good play? He got sacked because he didn't throw the football. He felt the pressure coming on, and he kept it in his glove. Right, and and didn't fumble the football as well, which uh, was the problem the last time he was in that situation. So actually, yes, Welsh learned something on this play. Vandals with the ball, batted away. Johnny Rydem, and I'll tell you what, number 90's had a wonderful football game out here. And you can just stack this one up on a, a couple of uh, the last few. He played well in Nevada. He played well against New Mexico State, and here he is coming up big again for the Bronco defense because now it is third and long for the Vandals, and uh, it is do-or-die situation on this play with just a minute to go. Our game clock is always brought to you by Thompson's Maytag, the dependability place for all your home appliances. Thompson's working overtime with this game. 59 seconds on the clock. Third down and 14. Welsh back to pass. Wants to go deep. Fires it. Willie Alderson has the first down. So Alderson gets it up to the 26. And you might have to say number 20 coming back to his homeland has been the MVP for Idaho in the second half. Oh, that was just a huge play there. Not only does it uh, get him a first down, but now they're, they're within field goal range as well. Vandals with no timeouts. Remember earlier in this half, they used a bunch of them that they felt they didn't need. They cannot stop the clock here unless they throw it down on the ground. And that is the case as Welsh just stops the clock. My question, why didn't he just step up and take the early snap? It looked like he was making alignments and whatnot. Yeah, it looked like he was calling a play, and it seemed like he was taking a, a long time to call uh, uh, just downing the football there. Uh, but that was uh, the way it went. There's 41 seconds to go. This is the play to Willie Alderson, who's running across the field. And just uh, look, at it was practically double coverage, and it was a nice job getting, uh, or at least he tried to get out of bounds. Wasn't quite able to do so, but the Nampa kid coming through for Idaho. Willie with his fifth reception for 74 yards. He's also got a touchdown. Second down and 10. Vandals John Welsh to pass. He throws it in a hurry, and because of the pressure put forth, he has to throw it away. The football is at the 26. Now you begin to say, what is the scenario come field goal time? It would probably be about a 46-yarder. Ben Davis on the season, he has had four block, his longest a 55-yarder, that in the dome. So certainly has the leg. Again, this is a, it's a little bit rainy. I don't see any wind. Well, a little bit wind. Looks like it's behind him, so that would help the Vandals. And now with the substitution play, you see some Vandals running off the field, some coming in. And now Joel Thomas runs back inside the numbers. Phil Early, the offensive coordinator, really mixing it up. Welsh trying to hang on to the ball. And the Broncos may want to use a timeout now to stop that clock because if Idaho's to score, they need some time to go the other way. Boy, I tell you what, Dave, there was one defender on two receivers out there for, you see the clock is continuing to click on down. Are they going to have enough time to get this uh, playoff? Now there's 18 seconds, and finally the Broncos do take a time. I think Coach Cutter's furious because he knows that's the scenario. Even if the Vandals kick the field goal, the Broncos have to look at it and say, we need some time on the clock. And you see the numbers on Davis today. As we told you, he has had four kicks blocked. A young man who grew up in Hayden Lake, Idaho, went to school at Coeur d'Alene, went on to Ricks, and now he finds himself 
crossing his fingers, at least here. Coach Cutter is talking to the officials right now. I think he was upset with that last play, that that substitution pattern somehow crossed the line and maybe was a little bit illegal or something. And as it turned out, Joel Thomas was, was unguarded. If they just would have thrown the ball to him, he could have gone downfield. Coach Cutter is arguing his case to that very point. Well, what he is livid about, keep in mind the players must run inside of the numbers, and that's what he's saying did not happen, is that the players that checked in, went out, did not get inside of the numbers, and they talked to the officials about that before the game, said make sure we don't mind the substitution as long as they stay within the rules. So Coach Tormey on the other side, resting it all on the foot of Ben Davis. And no doubt this is the biggest game in the career of Chris Tormey because if his team wins, they are headed to the Humanitarian Bowl. A 42-yard kick. Vandals and Broncos, 18 seconds on the clock. We are knotted at 28 all. The kick is up, and he missed it. He missed it. <laughs> we may be going to overtime, but we've got 14 clicks on the clock. Number 33 has been perfect all afternoon, but when the chips were down, it went astray, and the Broncos still have a breath remaining. I tell you what, Dave, you think about all that pressure on the young sophomore, and he just wasn't able to. That one didn't look good from the time it left his foot. It was kind of a low-line drive, didn't have the nice uh, over and under spin that they usually see on a kick uh, of that distance, and he just was unable to drill it through the uprights. Well, it definitely had enough distance. And he had a good hold and everything as well. I think it was just the pressure day. That's a tough situation to come in cold. And the Broncos are saying right now, we'll just go to overtime because a year ago, uh, we won this thing in overtime. So they take a knee, let the clock go, break out the rules for overtime for the second year in a row. And for the first time here at Broncos Stadium, we are going to the overtime, knotted at 28 all. We knew we'd need an extra frame for this one. You know, Dave, they talked about uh, last year's game. Hey, it was so good, they couldn't decide it in 60 minutes. They just had to get even a little bit more. Well, it's the same thing this year. This game has been so fantastic to watch as Idaho Super Bowl. What would be better than a little OT? So to this, we say what happens in overtime. Our producer, Jerry Long, says, well, let's break out the rules and show you exactly what the scenario team is. Extra period of course consisting of two series each team gets it at the 25 of course a year ago if you remember the Broncos scoring the touchdown that the Vandals get a chance to score they had to score a touchdown to tie it up they did not the Bronco D held up and thus that's the way it ended with Boise State winning it in overtime now the advantage of being the second team getting the ball as you know what happens you say okay we either have to score a touchdown or if you hold them you just go out and kick a field goal and win the thing right exactly you know what might be interesting about how this uh, overtime uh, figures out is which side of the football field will they do the 25 yard which side uh, of the 25 yard line because if it's in the bowl end of Bronco Stadium where there are several Bronco fans it could be a distinct advantage for the Broncos because the fans will yell and scream and make it difficult for the Vandals to try and score you remember last year when they went into overtime both uh, the Vandals and the Broncos get the ball on the same 25-yard line. They get the ball in the same part of the end zone uh, to work with. It's not like they'll just move the ball clear to the other side of the field after one team has had it serious. So it's just like a brand-new football game as all the captains will meet up out at, we'll call it center field, midfield mark. <laughs> Look at the Band-Aid there on the face of one of the Bronco players. But the idea here is you flip the coin. What's your philosophy? Because, Joe, I'm thinking if you win that coin flip, you say, all right, the other team gets the ball because we want to see what happens. That's exactly what I think. I, th I think you want to know exactly what your situation is. It's almost like a, in a game of, of cards, Dave. You want to see what the other player has before you show your hand, and you need to know what the situation is. I mean, you can have a completely different set of plays for whether you want to, whether you're coming from behind or whether you're trying to get that lead. Well, Jim Brecky clapping his hands like they won the toss. We'll find out exactly what happens. A year ago, the Broncos had the football first six yards back. Bart Hendricks. And that is a touchdown. Aaron Hurley. To number 24, and then the defense held, thus giving the Broncos the win. Lightning striking twice in the same place. The coin flip. 
I was thinking about that Southwest commercial I saw the other day where the officials said, you got a coin on you? <laughs> Someone pulls out a dollar bill. So the Vandals Iowa win the toss. Has won the toss and elected to go on defense. Vandals Boise will play State defense first, so the first Broncos the get it on offense line. at the 25-yard line, and basically what it means, the Broncos get their opportunity to score, and then the Vandals get a chance, and they're playing the card game just as you expected, Joe. Right, yeah, they win the toss. You, you send the other team out there first and see what they do. Now it's up to Coach Cutter and the gang to see what the Broncos are going to show in their hand. And it looks like they're going to set the ball up on the 25-yard line on the bowl end of the stadium, uh, which, uh, which is actually the reason why this uh, stadium has been expanded to 30,000 people. It used to be only 25 capacity here. Now it's 30,000, so you've got to figure there's an extra 5,000 fans down on this end of the stadium. So we are ready to go into overtime. They shut the clock off, basically, 28-28. The Broncos with the football on the 25. So Bart Hendricks with Aaron Hurley as his tailback. Rodney Smith, Antoine Wilson are the receivers. They'll try to throw it deep on the first play. Trying to get Rodney the football. Hendricks was under pressure, and that's somewhat of a gamble there. Uh, trying to throw it deep on the first play because remember you can still get a first down in the overtime You certainly can and try to k extend your series as well. It didn't look like uh, that uh, Rodney and uh, uh, Bart were on the same page on that particular play because it was well underthrown and and Rodney was still running his pattern when the ball was thrown and was clear downfield from where where the target area was Second down and ten if you just joined us we played regulation. We're into overtime now. Hendricks again fires it to Rodney, trying to shed the defender. He does so. Rodney now needs the first down, and he gets it. I was afraid for a moment, and so was the Broncos staff. He was going to run the other way and not get the first down. Right, yeah, just trying to get every yard he possibly could. He actually stepped back behind what would have been the first down and uh, was fortunate for him, and the Broncos was able to get uh, across the line. See, that's the line he needs to get across right there. Well, now he's behind it. Now he straddles it, and there, finally, he gets over the top and is able to get the first down. We will tell you that Keith Dilworth is out of the game at the right tackle position, thus the clumber, Greg Clum, coming in at that slot. And that's very important to protect Bart Hendricks from that right tackle spot. As a few series back, Dilworth helped off the field. They run option, Hendricks with the ball. Every time I see that option in a man in motion, I get a little nervous because we've watched two fumbles today for the Broncos. Yeah, it's just uh, it's hard to anticipate how someone will react when they know that they need to when they need to get the ball from center and run a play really very quickly. Uh, sometimes you forget the little things like like the snap, and that's exactly what you were talking about, Dave. That's the play that has cost the Broncos a couple times earlier. The football is at the 11, although Dirk Cutter was not the coach a year ago. Houston Nutt was running the show. Would coach call for that pass to Aaron Hurley? Uh, I, might as well. Hendricks throws it up. He's got Antoine Wilson for the touchdown. Well, the do-everything player for the Broncos has done everything now. <laughs> he has now scored the, the touchdown in overtime. Antoine's been running it, throwing it, and catching it. Bart Hendricks, just a perfectly uh, tossed pass here. It wasn't a, a bullet by any means. It's just a little touch pass over there, but uh, hard enough to get right into the paws of Wilson. The all-important extra point. Bel Castro kicks it up and through. So now the situation is this. The Vandals get the football. They have to score. If they score a touchdown, we go into a second overtime. If not, the Broncos come away with the victory. Here we go again, and boy, I just this game just keeps going on and on, back and forth. Look at that ball by Bart Hendricks, right into the paws of Wilson, into the back of the end zone, touchdown, and this is just the way it worked for the Broncos in their last game against Idaho. They scored the touchdown first. Now it's up to the Vandals to try and match. Chris Tormey 
who came over from the University of Washington as the defensive coordinator, ironically enough. Dirk Cutter coming over from Oregon as the offensive coordinator. Maybe the most heated rival in the Pac-10 when Oregon plays Washington. They used to say it was a civil war, Oregon, Oregon State. But my friend, it's the Ducks and the Huskies, and now it's moved on to the Vandals and the Broncos as Welsh carries the football. He gets big yards, but he's really popped hard when he turns the corner. Yeah, and it's Brian Johnson, the leader of that defense, coming to the forefront once again. He played big in overtime last year as that defensive unit stopped the Vandals from scoring a touchdown in overtime. And that time, boy, he just laid the leather on Welsh. We will remind you in the overtime, each team gets a timeout put back on the board. As Coach Johnson, the defensive line coach, who has done a marvelous job with that front four, sends in the signal. Crowd helping out here for the Bronco defense. Joel Thomas. Not much room for Joel Thomas, and it is a fumble. That's the ball game if it is a fumble. And no, the line judge comes up and says it's a dead ball that would have been the ball game right there if the Broncos would have come up with a football instead it is third down and one yard to go very very close on this play uh, we'll take a look at it here and see if he was yeah sure looked like he was down uh, at least uh, he was on the ground when the ball squirted out and uh, the rule you like to say is that it, uh, the ground can't cause the fumble and that time it looked like Joel was down the line judge come up and said yes he was third down of the yard and remember the Vandals don't have to score. They're just trying to get the first down here. They give it to Thomas. Thomas with running room. Pushes it across and gets the first down. Well, it is a heavyweight boxing match. We saw Kenny Keene in the stands, and he's probably enjoying this one. Oh, yeah, he's watching each, each of these teams taking the other's knockout punch and then, and then coming up from the mat and asking for more because this one is in is in X. I don't know if they have overtime in uh, boxing matches, though, Dave. They, once, uh, the they go to the card, out, right? They go to the <laughs> card. Who was leading on the punch count? 35-28, the Broncos with the lead in the first overtime. We don't need to tell you how much time is on the clock because it's all zero. Over time, they wipe it off and just say, you against me. Football's at the 10. Welsh wants to throw it in, and he gets it to the two-yard line, and that was uh, one of the tight ends. I believe it was Mike Roberg making the catch. Little crossing pattern by the two ends over on the right side, and R Roberg is the one that goes to the outside and makes the catch right there on the two. So now the Vandals with a couple of shots at the end zone. You know, this is do or die. They have three downs on second down, third down, and fourth down. Try to get into the end zone. Well, I'm thinking this is Joel Thomas territory. He's your strong back, and uh, just run up your offensive line and see what happens. Thomas with the football, and he is going to be in for the touchdown. So Thomas just using his speed, turning the corner. And you hate to stress this, but I've done a couple of overtime football games. In fact, one was against the University of Idaho playing Montana a few years back. Montana blocked the extra point attempt, and Montana winning the game. So here comes the extra point attempt, and Ben Davis on the season has missed six extra points. He's got to make this one to send it into a second overtime. Now it looks like the Broncos will call their timeout because if they go to a second overtime again, they'll get that timeout back. Well, do you think they're looking at the stats about Ben Davis, who missed the field goal, which he's thinking could have won this thing, mm -hmm. and now they're trying to put a little bit more heat on him. And Coach Cutter said, hey, you get to him. You might shake him up a bit. Well, I think uh, I think the Broncos are just returning the favor that the, the Vandals gave to them early in the game when they called three straight timeouts at the end of the first half trying to ice uh, uh, Bell Castro. This time, it's the Broncos trying to uh, ice the Vandals. And like you said, Dave, every single little point, every little play is so big and so amplified when you get into this part of a, of a game. Overtime in the last couple of minutes of the fourth quarter. Actually, looks like uh, Coach Tormey's having some fun in there. Oh, yeah. Why would you want to be a head coach? Well, look at this game. No better reason than that. Overtime. Keep in mind, the Broncos with a one-point lead. 
Vandals just scoring the touchdown. And all the 30,000 plus kind of holding their collective breath right here because your natural reaction is after the touchdown, let down, say, okay, here we go. Broncos get the football again. But the key is this extra point. Are they going for two, Joe? Joe, the Broncos are not ready defensively, and the Vandals are going for two to try to win the football game. If they get the two, they win the game. The Vandals have won the football game. They came out and showed that they were going for the extra point. They go for two, and the Vandals are headed to the Humanitarian Bowl. Keep in mind, Joe, the Vandals had a timeout there, so if the Bronco defense reacts, they use the timeout, they didn't, and they get the two. Right, and this is where using the timeout actually hurt the Broncos because they didn't have a timeout to use here. And so the Vandals come out, that's why they were smiling back there in their huddle because they know they're gonna come out here for two, try and catch the Broncos off guard, which they did. Joel Thomas gets into the end zone, and that road, that end zone leads right to the humanitarian ball. What a gutsy call, but because keep in mind, if the Vandals do not get the two-point, the Broncos win it. They were going for the, you were talking about knockout blows, Dave. That was going for the jugular. Either we're going to get it or we will not. Either we will win the game or we will lose. And uh, as it turned out, uh, the Broncos caught a little bit off guard, and uh, Coach Tormey and the gang, they score the two-point conversion and win this by one point. All right, Coach Cutter, uh, surprising play there at the end. Well, that, that, was a, that was a great call, a very gutsy call by Coach Tormey. Uh, that, that was a great call by them. They, they deserve it. All right, Bronco football coach Dirk Cutter talking with us after the game, and I think that was the big thing. What a gutsy call because keep in mind, if they don't get the two-point conversion, the Broncos win the football game. Boy, you just put everything on that one play, and, and you just say, I have the confidence in my team to get it done, knowing that if they don't get it done, you'll lose the game. All right, we will take a timeout. <laughs> Wild football game. The Vandals winning it by a single point. We'll be back on the blue right after this to wrap it up. Anybody did anything wrong because it just went down to one of those the last man standing was still up and a crazy play to win it for the Vandals. Boy, Aaron Hurley played the game of his life. Uh, just a fantastic effort on his part as uh, for the Broncos and the Vandals. You couldn't have asked for a better game for Idaho Super Bowl. How many games do you know that can go into overtime decided by one point, decided by one play? Just an incredible afternoon of football and a fantastic finish. So that means the University of Idaho will be back here on December 30th in the Humanitarian Bowl. Don't be surprised if you see John L. Smith back here as the Vandals will take on a team from Conference USA. Tulane is undefeated. Southern Mississippi, they are in there as well. That is the thought that that team may come here. But don't be surprised if the man that Joel Thomas is going to coach for in just about three months brings a Louisville team in here to play the Idaho Vandals. Howard Zuckerman and the crew, Kermit leading the way, directing a marvelous job. Jerry Long, who's been with us all season long. We've enjoyed bringing you Bronco football, but this one uh, capped it all. The Vandals and the Broncos going into overtime. Joe Hughes couldn't ask for anything better than that, huh? I just asked for a good game when I walk out the door. That's what we got. All right, everybody. For my statistician, Mike the Sports King Sharp, Joe Hughes, this is Dave Tester from the Super Bowl saying so long, and as always, good sporting.